Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I believe that I am audible to everyone. I am Dr. Suvarna Tikle. Thank you for joining virtual workshop on the adaptability of citizen science in Asian countries. To welcome is a show honor. As per our Indian culture, welcome is to establish the integrity. So on behalf of SEFA, University of West of England and Indian Institute of Technology Madras, I welcome you all invited speakers, professors, collaborators, experts, students, and citizens. As we gather here for the virtual workshop, I would like to request Professor Shivanagindra sir to introduce uh, about the SEFA project and deliver the speech. Okay. Uh, so now are you going to share the slides? Okay, thank you, Shivana. Yeah, uh, greetings from uh, SIPA Network, IIT Madras, and uh, University of West of England. Uh, we are very glad to bring to you the interesting workshop, the adaptive, adaptability of citizen science in Asian countries, uh, which will be bring you the several uh, you know case uh, studies carried out in UK and Europe. Uh, and explore the principles of citizen science, how, be, how to build communities of citizen scientists and uh, practical tips for uh, you know, deployment of uh, sensors, analyzing the data, interpretation, supporting the transition and to make the citizens adapt and understand this. We at uh, IIT Madras in collaboration with the University of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Institute of Occupational uh, Medicine, Edinburgh. We got a project on SIPA network. Can you go to the next slide? So SIPA network is partnering with uh, several uh, institutions and organizations, uh, which uh, comprises of both academic and uh, regulatory agencies. And they are all work together in trying to understand what works. So what are the gaps that are existing in some countries, some of the tools, technologies, and management policies may be working. In some countries, they may find it is little uh, you know, challenging to implement. So the SIPA network, one of the scope is to understand uh, what works and what uh, you know uh, the gaps that are existing, how we can incorporate or improve upon that. Okay, next. So the key five objectives of the SIPA network is engagement, capacity building, knowledge strengthening, identifying innovative solutions, community events, and networking, and also exploring the opportunities for the new grant and to sustain SIPA network activities. Next. So we are looking into the, the 17, uh, 17 goals uh, of uh, sustainable development uh, provided by United Nations. And if you try to look at it, the 17th goal is talking about the partnership uh, uh, you know, to address various environmental challenges. So we are working closely with uh, several universities to address you know, the environmental issues across the country. Okay, next. So we also initiated uh, several activities uh, as a part of a SIPA network uh, with the University of Surrey. We have made, uh, you know, uh, the, the manual uh, in uh, local language, the Malayalam and the Tamil, uh, which will uh, discuss about the mitigating exposure to traffic pollution in and around schools. It's particularly focused towards, uh, you know, children's. The next one uh, will be. Uh, we also made. A, documentation on a video or to show how the children can you know plan or help in managing the solid waste we also initiated the prakriti a newsletter which will uh, you know quarterly newsletter which brings about the various issues uh, that addresses the environment 
So all these uh, details are available uh, in the SIPA web link. Uh, I take this opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, we also made uh, uh, SIPA network active is a part of uh, uh, air quality management uh, lecture series. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to highlight uh, uh, Professor uh, Enda was who gave a lecture uh, in uh, one of the air quality management lecture series, and it was well appreciated. And uh, several eminent speakers are also subsequently provided. It is one of the success as a part of uh, you know, our collaborative and uh, networking activities. Next. And uh, so in, uh, in addition, we also initiated several workshops uh, and uh, uh, you know panel discussions, creative drawings, and uh, dissemination of some of the events through panel, uh, you know, uh, panel discussion, uh, one minute video, and uh, uh, creative posters. So we have made, conducted several events for different age groups, and uh, it, it was uh, uh, received very well uh, in the community. Next. Uh, so in this uh, workshop, just to highlight uh, to uh, Professor uh, Enda, so we have invited, uh, you know, both uh, uh, there are you know participants from academics, and uh, uh, there are uh, people who are representing industries, communities, and uh, several research scholars, and also uh, regulators who are you know managing the the various issues, and uh, key NGOs. And you may be knowing this. And I'm happy to say a Rotary organization is an across the globe. So they are also participating this uh, uh, in this particular workshop. Next. Okay, so now uh, uh, without taking not much time, uh, I would like to again uh, welcome uh, Professor Enda and Williams uh, for uh, taking their time, busy time uh, in uh, you know uh, organizing or providing, sharing their valuable. Uh, experience in uh, you know how citizen science uh, can be helpful in addressing some of the key environmental challenges uh, uh, professor venda thank you very much so now i'll uh, ask us to so, so to introduce uh, you and then go to you after that thank you dr shivana gendra sir it's my really great pleasure to introduce professor enda professor enda is working as a professor of air quality and carbon management and the director of the Air Quality Management Resource Center at University of West of England, Bristol, United Kingdom. He has been working in the environmental field for over the two decades with the primary focus on atmospheric emission and management. Professor Enda has worked with local, national, as well as international government on a range of air quality and carbon management projects. And he is the scientific director of various UK and EU research projects focus on citizen behavior and air pollution. So I request Professor Enda to please deliver his talk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, probably, uh, uh, Professor Enda, we will also just introduce because this workshop is uh, jointly organized by Williams also uh, as a, a researcher from uh, working with Professor Enda. So, Suvarna, could you just introduce uh, William? Then we will offer the, you know, uh, and, uh, platform to Professor Enda and uh, Dr. Williams. Okay, sir. So, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Bain William. Dr. Bain William has 13 years of experience in environmental sampling analysis and apportionment of air pollution. Currently, he is working as a research fellow in Air Quality Management Resource Center, University of West of England, Bristol, England. His PhD is focused on development of the method of the sources apportionment and the mapping of fugitive PM and industrial facilities using geochemical fingerprinting and environmental forensic approaches. He worked as an environmentalist consultant for five years for developing and undertaking novel source apportionment investigation for various industries and regulatories. Dr. Bain has worked on a research project at national and international level as PI, co-PI, and PDRA. Currently, he works on several research projects, including the Horizon 2020, funded by citizen-led air pollution reduction in cities, 
NERC funded bioaerosol characterization and dispersion modeling and Welcome Trust funded impacts of built environment on health and economy and engagement with the local communities on the same topic that is I much. Air quality dust and air quality monitoring, airborne microplastic source apportionment are his main research areas. So now I request Dr. Anderson to continue his talk. Uh, so uh, just a minute before you start your talk, there is one request to participant. You can ask any question in chat box. After both talk, we will prioritize your question and we'll discuss on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Can I ask that you can hear me okay? That's the, the first thing we have yes. to do on these sessions. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so thank you for the kind introductions and thank you for inviting us along to talk to you today about citizen science. Um, so myself and my colleague Ben are going to basically talk you through some of the principles of citizen science, but also talk you through our experience of leading citizen science projects. Um, in particular, I have to be very honest, I am a new convert to citizen science. I've always worked at that interface between science and policy, but now I'm really starting to understand the value of turning what is a, a two-way interface, science and policy, into a three-way nexus of science, policy, and working with the public. It has huge value, both in terms of um, raising awareness of whatever environmental or other issues that you want to explore, but also in terms of um, bringing people into the debate and making them part of the conversation, a meaningful part of the conversation. So what we've got as a title is the adaptability of citizen science in Asian countries. I will be very honest. I don't think an Irishman working in the United Kingdom can answer that question. But what we can do is share our experience and then use your local knowledge to understand what would work, what wouldn't work, and why that might be. So what we will do is we have broken the session up into uh, th five presentations, or six presentations. Um, we're going to talk, when, when I initially got engaged in citizen science projects, and in the early days of citizen science as a discipline, I think there was always a perception of you get a sensor, you give it to a member of the public, and they generate data for you. And that's a very, very small and kind of myopic view of what can be a really exciting discipline and a really exciting methodology. So what we've tried to do is to break the session up into a number of different uh, key elements where we will explore the kind of citizen science pathway. So the first session, we're going to talk about the principles of citizen science projects, and I'll do a quick introduction to three case studies, three projects that we're working on. We'll then talk about how you build communities of citizen scientists, so how you get them engaged, how you get them involved, how you get them to take ownership of the science projects. We'll then talk about once you've got your communities of science, some practical tips in terms of sensor deployment and getting your technology out there and how you can get people uh, to easily engage with that tech. We might take a quick break then, a quick comfort break, and then we'll come back to talk about the data analysis and data interpretation, which as a scientist, I think is actually the key element because you want to make sure that your citizens are interpreting the data correctly. And then we'll talk about how you can help citizens to transition from a citizen scientist into a citizen advocate in terms of how they use the data and how they might push forward with policy. And then finally, we're going to hand over uh, to Sachin to talk about the hybrid air quality monitoring network and how we might be able to integrate these new technologies into our monitoring networks and really answer one of the very, the most difficult questions around citizen science, which is um, how you make it 
uh, digestible, if you like, or palatable uh, for policymakers, and they will actually work with it. So as we move along, there will be opportunities for questions. And as we've mentioned, we can put those into the chat. But then at the end of the session, what I'd like to do is have a, a bit of a roundtable discussion where, where we stop talking and we get to hear from you in terms of can we answer the question about the adaptability of citizen science in Asian countries? Can we answer the question about how to make citizen science data more relevant for policymakers? And can we ask a question about how to ensure the legacy of citizen science beyond the lifetime of a project? So that's roughly our outline for the next two, two and a half, three hours. So I'm going to share my screen and we will start with the first session. If it's okay with everyone, I'm just gonna turn my video off so that it helps with uh, bandwidth. Um, okay, share my screen. Okay, window session one, share. Okay, can I? ask can everyone see this presentation they should say session one principles of citizen science yes sir excellent thank you very much okay then so session one we're going to talk about some of the basic principles and i'll introduce you to some of the projects that we have got so and we're going to talk about what is citizen science? I think that's probably the best place to start and to look at how kind of citizen science has evolved into becoming a mainstream research methodology. Now, there's a number of different citizen science methods, but what I'd like to focus on is a process called the Bristol method. It's one that we have adapted and used quite a lot. Um, and it's also one of the more prominent methodologies uh, that's currently being used in the UK and Europe. And it was created in Bristol, where the University of the West of England is based. I'll also mention this kind of idea of the quadruple helix, which is about bringing different people and different actors together as part of a project. And then finally, we'll talk about three projects. We Count, which is a citizen science project looking at urban transport. Slow the Smoke, a citizen science project looking at air pollution from solid fuel burning. And Homes Under the Microscope, a citizen science project looking at microplastics in the indoor environment. So lots of different definitions about citizen science, but the one that I really like is this uh, Hecker def definition from 2018, in that quite simply, citizen science is a participatory process characterized by public engagement with science and the support of alternative models of knowledge production. Put quite simply, researchers, scientists, citizens, businesses, industry, NGOs, all coming together to create new knowledge with the citizens as your sample, as your population who are generating the data for you. Now, this next bullet point I've actually recently changed. It used to say citizen science is a rapidly growing field. And actually, I don't think that's right. I think citizen science is now an established field of research, but it is rapidly evolving. It's evolving into new subject. It's evolving into new areas. As technology develops, it's evolving quite rapidly with that. And in doing so, it really um, embraces this concept of open science and about open and social innovation, basically making science more accessible and more open for citizens. Now, to do this, we obviously have to collaborate with citizens in order to collect and to analyze information, which is scientifically valuable. And I think that's a common goal for pretty much anyone. But there's an increased awareness that this kind of knowledge can be beneficial beyond the society or uh, scientific domains. We're seeing more public policies and more public bodies and regulators um, embracing this methodology because quite often there's a, a detachment, if you like, from policymakers to the public. And doing citizen science allows everyone to come together and sit around this, uh, the same table. It encourages more development of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math skills in people, and it creates a much stronger sense of ownership and collaboration among citizens. 
Um, as you've seen, I've put hyperlinks in here of various different uh, publications that people might want to look at uh, when they have their own time. So when we think about citizen science, I tend to think of it as a very simple funnel where you look at three specific elements and they come together. New technologies and innovative engagement methods are certainly opening up and have opened new opportunities for engagement. And particularly in the environment and indeed the air pollution field, low cost sensors and um, citizen friendly sensors, so kind of low tech and low cost sensors are really good for uh, allowing people to come on board. And, and reducing the threshold, the kind of scientific and technical threshold that citizens need to have to be able to engage with this tech and with this data. What we're also seeing, I think this is a standard across the world, is a, a kind of a surge of citizen advocacy, a surge of active citizenship, and a surge of bottom-up initiatives where citizens are starting to become more vocal, uh, more aware, more knowledgeable about the issues that they're trying to, to engage with, and thereby by embracing this active citizenship, we can bring it together into a really exciting mix that allows active citizenship, new and innovative technology engagement methods to come together with other stakeholders to actually have more meaningful data, a more meaningful interpretation, and more meaningful discussions around various different societal issues. Now, within the environmental debate, I think it's fair to say that across the world, we have seen a focus on top-down policymaking. So the policy is being made by national and by local governments, and then it is going down to businesses, to NGOs, and indeed to communities and to the public. Now, while that's a, an established policy methodology, it does have its limitations because when it comes to engaging the public, we tend to have these, these three methods of engagement. Transmit is where a, a governmental body might generate data and we put it on a website and we simply push it out there. We just we give it to people and we let them use the data or the information as they see fit. Receive is where we might do a uh, interviews or focus groups or surveys with the public. Um, but it's very time limited and it's very kind of um, it's very bookended in, the, in terms of you might start a consultation, receive their feedback and then you adapt with it and you work with it. You never continuously engage with citizens. Where the exciting space is, is around this idea of collaboration. And this is where we can try and then look at how bottom up policy development and bottom up data generation can then talk to top down policy making and top down, top down data generation. And we can actually look at where, the, uh, where there are synergies and then we can also look at where there are trade-offs and then we can also look at where gaps might exist and how we can work together to do them. And I think the exciting space here is that we start to change the conversation a little bit and we start to actually get urban environments and policies around the urban environment that uh, kind of move away from what policymakers and scientists think the public want to actually policymakers and scientists and businesses and NGOs working with the public to actually give them what they want based on the feedback and the work that we receive. Now, there are a number of different citizen science frameworks that are out there, and this is just uh, two examples that I've played. But ultimately, it's about looking at the role played by citizens and the level of empowerment. And that's a really important word here, the empowerment that citizen science projects can create. So Hackley uh, looked at various methods from kind of basic crowdsourcing, where the users act as a sensor to extreme citizen science, the most empowering level, which is kind of situated at the bottom of practice and takes into consideration local needs and practices. Bonnie actually looked at a number of different types of citizen science. Contributory, contributory citizen science, where the citizens are observing and collecting data. Collaborative citizen science, where they they move beyond just observing and collecting data, but they actually get involved in refining the project design, analyzing the data, disseminating the results. And then the, the really exciting space, but also the space most hardest to create, is this 
co-creation methodology where the citizen science work with the scientists, work with the various actors in this space to design the kind of inquiry together and to share the majority of the steps in the scientific process. Now, all of these are citizen science frameworks, but as you can imagine, looking at the three different types described by Bonnie, there the amount of resource, the amount of time, and the amount of effort grows as you go from contributory to collaborative to co-created. And this is a kind of a very basic framework that we have created. This was for uh, one of our WeCount projects. And ultimately, it needed to have uh, three essential components. It needed to ensure that the citizen science approach put citizens' concerns at the heart of the process, that the approach to, uh, to monitoring and evaluation of their participant and participation, and indeed their non-participation, was included, and that there was a use of the various different available tools for sensing and for various different re related aspects. So what we get is this kind of integrated space where we are developing the eco-science ecosystem. So this might be aggregation of best practice. It could be building networks, nurturing local champions, creating your citizen science communities. And that helps then look uh, design your data platform or your sensing platform, because you then get those champions and get those citizens involved in this participatory co-design process. This allows you to then pilot and put demonstration studies in place. This is where your communities are built. This is where you get them collecting data. This is where you get them analyzing and interpreting the data and looking at how they might feed into policies. And then you have your monitoring and evaluation of activities, which is a really, really important step because you want to understand how well your system performed you want to design a monitoring and evaluation framework you want to ensure that your ethics and your privacy are all carefully uh, managed you want to look at the quality of the censoring data and then you want to look at the scalability of your approach so as a very simple framework and a simple model this for a for a, a project that might involve uh for example, our Slow the Smoke project where we're using Luftdaten sensors, so PM sensors to look at um, solid fuel burning, this very simple kind of four-step model allows everyone to come together. But there's also a lot of kind of cross-cutting principles, STEM, gender balance, social science, public engagement, sustainable development goals, as we've already seen mentioned, uh, communication and dissemination, responsible research, these cut across all of these steps. So I mentioned the Bristol approach and I mentioned the quadruple helix. Um, the Bristol approach was developed a few years ago in Bristol um, by uh, people at the Norwest Media Studio in collaboration with Mara Balestrini from um, Ideas for Change in Barcelona. Now, the idea of the, the quadruple helix is that you're bringing four communities together to work in this space. You are bringing scientists, you are bringing uh, uh, policymakers and regulatory bodies, you are bringing industry and business and NGOs, and you are bringing the citizens together. And that's the idea of this quadruple helix, that you have these four groups of actors, four groups of stakeholders already working or coming together as part of a project. And what the Bristol approach gives is a set of tools or a set of ways of working where these different actors can all come together to look at a specific issue. And it's best designed by this very simple framework. So step one is working with the actors to identify what are the key issues you want to address and the change that you want to bring about. Step two is then framing those issues in much more detail and exploring how you could harness the power of technology, such as a low cost sensor, and indeed the data you might generate to try and address this issue. Step three then is around designing the process and creating any of the tools you need to help you gather the data or understand the issue. Step four is deployment, putting it into practice, getting it out there in the real world and getting people generating that data. Step five is orchestration. So sharing the tools and the data with others, and then indeed celebrating what you've achieved, making noise about what's happened. And then step six is the outcome, evaluating what you've achieved, 
and then you can refine the process and keep running through this cycle. So the approach is quite simple. And through the morning, we are going to talk about these various different steps in more detail. Now, there are countless different successful citizen science initiatives out there, and I've mentioned just some of them here. Um, Dino's, for example, is looking at odor and how you can use apps and different technology for uh, looking at odors in the urban environment. WeCount, as, I, as, I, as we'll discuss in detail, is looking at transport. And We Observe is a really, really great website which actually brings together all of the various different urban lab and citizen science initiatives going on around uh, Europe. So you can look at lots of different examples. So if you are thinking about designing a citizen science project, what I, what I always tend to say is it's innovation, not invention. And what I mean by that is you don't have to invent the wheel. You just have to be innovative by putting the wheel on a wheelbarrow. Somebody has already invented the wheel for you. Somebody has already created these methodologies, created these exciting initiatives. I think the, the real exciting space is how you innovate from what they have already done to make it work for you in your particular topic area or indeed in your geographical location. And that might help answer some of the questions about an Asian context. So finally, in this session, what I'd like to uh, just introduce is three projects and how you can see these different citizen science frameworks in action. And we'll be coming back to these projects off and on over the, the, the session this morning so that uh, you can see how we've uh, kind of interwoven the Bristol approach, the six steps into our approach. And what I've said for the Bristol approach is we haven't adopted it in its entirety. We have adapted it to make it work for our projects and our ideas. So the first project is WeCount, or Citizens Observing Urban Transport. And the idea of WeCount is that we wanted to get citizens to quantify transport or traffic in their local roads and in doing so produce new knowledge around local uh, mobility and then to work with them to kind of co-create solutions using this data, exploring a range of different issues, uh, traffic volumes, speeding, uh, so rat running, which is kind of cutting through smaller roads to beat the traffic, uh, looking at kind of peak episodes of transport and then looking at related issues like air pollution and noise. Now, in doing so, we currently have about 1,500 citizen science actively engaged in traffic counting across Europe, and we try to ensure we get a, as much as we possibly can a, a fair split in terms of gender and different personas. We've also very deliberately tried to detect the technology. And what I mean by that is make the technology as simple as we possibly can so that we can reach out to a much wider community and indeed engage with people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who perhaps traditionally would not engage with a project like this. And what WeCount is doing very simply is putting a traffic sensor on a window and that traffic sensor is looking at the road and counting everything that goes past. So it works a little bit like a motion sensor. We've got a Raspberry Pi in this um, in this black box. Um, I'm assuming everyone knows what a Raspberry Pi is, but for those of you that you don't, it is a very cheap and cheerful computer. Um, so the Raspberry Pi has an SD card in it with our software. That is connected to a camera, which is this little circular um, thing you see hanging from the stuck to the window. The camera is pointing at the road, and then we are counting what goes by. We count cars, we count large vehicles, we count cyclists, we count pedestrians, and we can also assess car speeds. And anyone from the air quality community and who's ever done a dispersion modeling study of traffic will realize that this gives you a huge amount of data not only to do your dispersion modeling studies, but also then to look at things like exposure for pedestrians and for cyclists and indeed for, for people in their, in their residences. So a lot of both direct and indirect data coming from this. Now, one of the things we deliberately did was try and make sure that all the data was open access. So everything 
is open access. The sensors can all be bought online. The data for the people who are engaged is all free to be downloaded. The algorithms for the sensor is publicly available and can be used and can be downloaded. So everything is open access. Everything is accessible. Everything is there for people to, to work with. And this sensor kit uh, it costs about 60 pounds sterling um, to get all of the components. I'm not entirely sure how that translates into local currency, but roughly 60 pounds sterling. To give you an idea, for 60 pounds, you can have a sensor up and running for a year. Whereas if you wanted to put pneumatic tubes in place for counting traffic, that would cost you about 1500 pounds for two weeks. So in terms of cost benefit, it's quite substantial. And how it works is very simple. It looks at the, the axis ratio. So the kind of size of the vehicle that it's looking at, and then it looks at the observed fullness. So how much of this, of the, the image does the, th does the object uh, fill? And in doing so, you can then determine whether it's a car or a van. And this is the sort of data we start to get out of it. So we've got citizen science active all over Europe. We've got the, we created our communities of users. We gave them the sensors. They've generated this sort of data and now we're exploring it with them. So for example, on the top left, we can see compliance with the speed limit. So this is this red and yellow graph on the left-hand side. And we can see which times of the day uh, do we have or do we not have compliance with the speed limit? And as you can see, pretty much every hour of the day and every day of the week, we have people exceeding the speed limit on this particular road. And indeed, in the mornings and on a Saturday and a Sunday morning is where we see the most speeding happening. On the right hand side is again speed data, and we can look at how this is used in terms of creating policy change. So what we had was a citizen who was basically on a daily basis uh, sending a text message or a, an email to his local councillor complaining about non-compliance with the speed limit. They introduced a speed awareness camera and you can see the point on the graph at which that was introduced. And then you can see the amazing split that happened in terms of non-compliance um, dropped off from about 55% down to 35% and compliance grew from about 50% to 65%. So you can see how this data can then be used for, um, for, uh, for bringing about meaningful change. And then at the bottom, we can then start to look at the data in terms of uh, different traffic behaviors and different attitudes. So on the left-hand side, we have a kind of a very normal diurnal profile in that we are seeing uh, light blue on the left-hand side, which is traffic, if you like, going into town and then a darker blue on the right hand side, which is traffic coming out of town. Now, if you compare that to the rat running graph on the left hand side, or sorry, on the right hand side, you can see that you have dark blue in the morning and you have dark blue in the afternoon, which suggests that people are just using that road for going in one direction and for uh, rat running in a certain direction. So that gives you the kind of idea of the data that a, a very simple piece of kit can generate and how we might use it uh, to better inform our local decisions. The second project is Slow the Smoke. This is funded by DEFRA, which is the UK uh, National Government Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And the idea of Slow the Smoke is that we want to work with citizens in Bristol and Bristol City Council are leading this project. So it's not the scientists that are leading here. It's actually the local authority who is taking the lead with the support from uh, a scientific team. And what we're doing is looking at um, how we might uh, raise awareness and how we might bring about reductions in PM, particulate matter emissions, from solid fuel burning using a citizen science engagement methodology. Now, this project is still in its very, very early stages, but the problem we have got looking at this image on the right is that in the uh, city centre and indeed in the poorer parts of the city, we see a lot more solid fuel burning for heating and cooking. And this is creating a PM10 problem. So we are using a low cost sensor called a Luftdaten sensor to actually work with the local communities and, sorry, one second, to work with the local communities um, to 
basically quantify um, the concentrations of particulate matter uh, in the area and then use that data to create a new conversation, a new debate about PM10. And then the final project, which we'll describe, is one that my colleague Ben Williams is leading, which is called Homes Under the Microscope. And this is where we have moved into the indoor environment. And this is where we are asking citizens to help us look at airborne microplastics or microfibers in the home and how different uh, indoor environments and different behaviors actually affects its generation. And what we have got is, oops, uh, there we go, we'll come back to the second. So we've got this kind of three phase uh, approach. The first is a kind of a pilot approach in Bristol where we're working on evaluating microscopes, uh, data capturing techniques, imaging tools, and how we might process that. And once we've piloted that with our community in Bristol, then we're rolling it out to more citizens in Bristol and in Bradford to then look at how it might be implemented on a larger scale. Now, one of the exciting things about this project is the buy-in and engagement from industry in that they're much more engaged, much more hands-on. We've got the uh, microfiber consortium, which is a consortium of different industrial partners um, working with and engaging and supporting the project. Um, for example, Ben had a, a workshop a, a couple of weeks ago that had IKEA present and wanted to work with us and, and debate with us. So the three projects shows different examples of implementation. One is being led by the scientists, that's WeCount. One is being led by uh, the local authority, that's Slow the Smoke. And this one, Holmes, is being led by the scientists, but with a very, very hands-on and engaged industrial community. And this is what we're what Ben is doing and his colleagues are doing. Very simply, they're basically asking citizens to put sticky tape into uh, different places around the home, leave it exposed for two weeks. And what happens is the microfibers and the microplastics settle on this forensic tape. The citizens then have a low cost uh, microscope so they can actually look at the samples themselves and they can take pictures of it and they can upload these pictures on the web. And then they send the samples back into us and then we analyze them using a ramen so that we can look at what exactly is there. The outcomes of this are kind of an informed citizens, citizenry. We get a, a, a repository of microfiber data that hasn't previously existed. And then we could get citizens and industry working together to look at policy options. Now, the final slide I want to leave you on, leave you on here is attitudes, because what we have learned from these projects is that the attitude towards citizen science can vary substantially. You tend to get two attitudes and they're, they're kind of amplified. Well, you tend to get three views. View number one, and this is from often from local and regulatory authorities, is citizen science. It's not our business. Citizens can do whatever they want. It's up to them. It's fine. View number two is citizen science is really annoying. OK, it's giving us inaccurate data. It's raising questions we don't want to deal with. It just creates problems. It's it's not something I really want to to engage with. View number three is it's great fun. Count us in. We want to be part of this. We want to invest our time and our energy to work with you to help you do all of these issues down here and things like explaining the information, assuring quality, making the data available, providing context to that data, interpreting the data, looking at continuity for the program and for the legacy. So our regulatory bodies, our industrial bodies, you can either take view one or view two, but actually it's view three where you get this really, really exciting collaborative engagement between uh, this uh, between the the quadruple helix if you like the citizens the scientists the policymakers and industry and NGOs all coming together to share their knowledge and share their insights and when you get that exciting quadruple helix happening that is when citizen science really shows its true value as moving beyond a an awareness project to actually becoming a data generation project which can then be used 
for policy making. So that's the first session. That's a, an exploration of citizen science. Um, if I stop sharing my screen for a moment, we can see if there are any questions we want to address at this stage. And if not, then we will simply move into session two and we can pick it up at a later date. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat. So if not, I think we'll move on and we can pick them up at a later date. Is that OK, Shiva? Yeah, that's fine, uh, Professor Enda. OK, right then. So there are the principles of citizen science. Here's the introduction to kind of three very different projects who are all using citizens for transport, for air quality or for microplastics in the indoor environment. But what you will see over the next few sessions is the implementation of the different steps in the citizen science framework. And we'll give you different examples from our experience as to what worked and what didn't work. And we'll draw upon the three projects to uh, look at that. So if I open my second presentation, and I'll share that, uh, share screen, window, session two, share. Okay, so can I just check that everyone can see this? Session two, scoping and building communities of citizen scientists. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so they're the principles of citizen science. There's an example of three very different projects who are all adapting a very similar framework, which is the, the Bristol approach to, um, to run our projects. And what we're going to talk through now is the different steps of those Bristol approach starting with step one and two, which is around scoping and building communities of citizen science. And what we're trying to get out of this is to try and help, help you understand how you scope and co-design projects with citizens, how you do a, ste a step called stakeholder mapping, which personally I think is probably one of the most important things you will ever do in a citizen science project. I, it's one I'll be very honest, I didn't appreciate the value of stakeholder mapping until I did it. Uh, then we look at community building. And then I want to look at this idea of scalable by design, how you can have different principles to kind of start small, but then start to, to grow it and make it bigger and bigger. Finally, then I'll talk about the kind of guiding principles for a communication strategy. And then I'll also look at monitoring and evaluation. So as we're going through this session, what I've given you or what I'm going to talk about is various different tools and different resources and different experiences that I hope you can draw from and hope will kind of inspire you and facilitate you to do what you want to do. Um, it's not a recipe book. It's not ending. We're constantly adding to this kind of uh, this, this kind of book of tools and resources. And it's just a limited example, primarily drawn from the WeCount project to give you an idea. So I mentioned the Bristol uh, approach, and this is how we adapted the Bristol approach to make it work for the WeCount project. Step one, community building and scoping. Step two, co-design. Step three, data collection. Four, data awareness and analysis. And five is legacy. And we've kind of used this framework to set out the following sessions. So in this session, I will talk about scoping, community building and co-design. And then Ben, my colleague, will talk about data collection, data analysis and uh, um, uh, data advocacy, so how you move beyond just data generation. So this is where we are going to focus our time. So the first phase is basically the approach where you gradually narrow down the focus of the project or the focus of the intervention you are looking at. And by doing that, you also create a community of participation. So what I might mean by that is Take the WeCount project, for example. The WeCount project, large aims at a very high level, was asking citizens to count traffic on their street. 
okay? And in doing so, we were going to use this low cost Telram sensor, Raspberry Pi sensor to do this. Now, what the scoping and community building step allows you to do is move the question down from a very high level counting transport to actually look at the research questions that the citizens want to look at. Not the ones that me, the scientist, wants to kind of um, 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 embed or imprint on top of citizens, but actually looking at the local lived experience of what they want to get out of the data. So you go from counting transport to looking at road safety and speeding, to looking at air quality, to looking at peak traffic episodes, to looking at splits of traffic types in terms of larger vehicles or smaller vehicles, to looking at active travel. These are all very more localized issues that your citizens and your communities want to look at. And what we've got here is various different steps and tools that can be adjusted depending on the level of granularity of your project and also the spatial granularity of the area that you are looking at. So the first thing we think it's important to do is to achieve a situated understanding of the local issues. Now, what we mean by a situated understanding of the local issues is greater insight of what's happening on the ground on that particular street, in that particular community, in that particular neighborhood or corner of the city or region or whatever it might be. And actually, there's a huge value in this approach or this first step because it allows you, the scientist, or you, the regulatory body, to get a greater understanding of what's being experienced at the bottom what's being experienced by our local communities and by our citizens. And in doing so, what we want to do is to break down local issues into more specific matters of concern experienced within the city or within the community. We allows us to develop a, a pilot narrative. So it allows us to develop um, not just a kind of scientific um, case for support that you may have put together while you were writing your bid, to get the money to do your project, but a much more citizen-led narrative around the local un, local issue you're trying to look at. And it allows you to kind of co-create a definition of the current and relevant issues. And it's really the first step in bringing these various actors together to share their knowledge, to share their insights, and to share their different ideas. And that's a really, really important step because as a scientist or as a scientific community or as a regulatory body or an NGO who might be undertaking these projects, you do not want to get off on the wrong foot in terms of a citizen science project by walking in and then telling the citizens what they are going to do. That's not how this works. You want to allow the citizens to come to you and to be part of this very early narrative in understanding the issue that you're trying to explore. And there's various different tools and methods for doing this. You can do uh, surveys. It could be citywide. It could be very localized. For example, in WeCount, um, we didn't do any surveys in Cardiff, which is one of our case studies here in the UK. But in Bristol, or sorry, in Barcelona, in Spain, and in uh, Leuven, um, I think they did do uh, surveys. So different steps, different approaches. Another thing you might do is look at kind of desk-based research in terms of what's already happening out there. Now, that's something we did do in Cardiff in that we did a, a policy mapping exercise where we looked and spoke to key stakeholders and we looked at key policies and we tried to understand how did we get to the current situation that we are in. So a kind of historical mapping and then looking at future plans and future strategies to think about how our citizen science project and data can feed into those strategy areas. So this desk-based research and this mapping and these interviews are these surveys of local officials and citizens groups. It's a really, really good and exciting way of bringing all your four actors together to understand the local issue from various different perspectives. And once you've done that, then you can start to go a little bit deeper. Then you can start to explore the perceived 
topic related matter of concern. So the topic could be transport, it could be air quality, it could be water quality, it could be soils, it could be green infrastructure, it can be whatever topic you're exploring as part of your project. But once you've done the first step, which is this situated understanding, now you can start to get, explore the matters of concern. Now you can start to kind of deep dive into what is really upsetting local people. What are they really concerned about? What can the citizen science start to help you with? Now, when you do this, you break down the issues into more specific matters. So you start to go from very high aims into much more focused and localized research questions. It helps you develop your project narrative, which will become really, really valuable for recruiting citizens at a later stage. It allows you to look at community building and it allows you to look at the promotion of the project. Various ways of doing this, focus groups, street corner chats, participatory workshops, it's really up to you how you might go about doing this and how you might um, uh, bring people together. Now, what we learned over the last two years is that citizen science needed to adapt because we had a little thing called COVID, which fundamentally changed the way we had to go about our project. Because of COVID, we would normally have been running face-to-face -face workshops and focus groups and a lot more bringing communities physically together. But because of COVID, we didn't do, we couldn't do that. So we had to do a lot of work uh, looking at online methodologies and online workshops where we can bring various different communities together. And that has its pros and its cons because I think what we've all learned, not just through citizen science, is what we've all learned is that um, you can get exhausted from these online, uh, online sessions. Um, it is a very tiring thing to kind of go through these, but also when you're trying to build communities, that human interaction, that face-to-face -face interaction, looking at people's body language, looking at how different individuals are engaging or not engaging, that has huge value when you're trying to build communities, in particular when you're trying to kind of identify local champions. So we've had to adapt, but in doing so, I think we've made it more accessible we've also run into uh, other options or other problems. So once we've focused everything down, then the next step is to look at mapping the local ecosystem. So we've done the policy mapping. We've worked with our communities to kind of focus down our, um, our research questions. Now we have to look at who our key actors are beyond the kind of four stakeholders that you might have in place. So this can be things like looking at Facebook groups. It can be things like looking at Twitter and seeing who's the most uh, vocal and noisy about the particular topic you are looking at. It can be working with NGOs and with local authorities and local universities to bring these different actors and different stakeholders together. Again, a really, really important step because what happens is you start to identify who the local champions are. What you, what you want to get beyond is I am the university or the lead organization, and I, I am now going to engage 100 citizen scientists. That means you have to try and find 100 people. But if you, through this stakeholder mapping, can find 10 influential people, and then those 10 people find 10 more, then you start to get this snowballing effect. Whereas you work with 10, they work with 10 more, they work with 10 more, and then you can start to roll the project out. So this stakeholder mapping activity is really, really good. Social media is great for finding your local actors, but the, the knowledge of your partners and your local communities who would be part of this quadruple helix uh, group of actors is really valuable as well. So once we've done this step, now we have to build our community. We've done everything to kind of get our questions right, look at our key policies, look at our key um, map, our, our, our key stakeholders. Now we need to get them together. And this is the start of the process of our, our building our citizen science community. These are the people who will join, who will run your sensors, who will take the project forward. The community champions are massively important here. I, you cannot do a citizen science project 
without these champions. These will be your voice in the local community. But what they also offer isn't just recruitment. What they offer is trust. Because what you can get is, oh, they're the university are doing another project. Oh, okay. Or what you might get is, you know, why is this Irish guy telling me about air pollution in Bristol? Or you can get, um, oh, the local authority wants me to collect data for them. Oh, I wonder what they're trying to do now. So you, you always have this, sometimes this element of mistrust that might exist within communities. Having the local champion, having that local community leader to be your voice on the ground, to be your partner to help implement the project is hugely important because that local champion will have the trust of the local community. If you can win over the local champion, then you usually can win over the community quite easily at a later stage. Now, one of the things about community building that you have to be careful with is that you need to ensure that everyone feels engaged with the community and they feel like they have an important role to play. For example, with um, We Count in Cardiff, the case study we looked after, um, we rolled out 100 sensors. So we had 100 people counting traffic around the city, roughly 100 people. But we actually had 280 people as part of our community. Now, in a particular location, it may be that their, their window wasn't suitable for um, counting or for, um, for looking at the road, or it might be for various reasons they weren't able to run a sensor for us. But we still wanted to hear from them. We still wanted them to be engaged. We wanted them, we wanted to understand their local knowledge, their local insights. We wanted them to help us with the interpretation of the data so that we understood how the local context mapped on top of this data. And we wanted them to help us with um, uh, rolling out um, our, our, our policy messages and our communication messages. And actually in Cardiff, uh, uh, the, the city we were looking after, one of the best local champions we have does not actually have a sensor. She is just really passionate uh, about active travel. She's really passionate about the environmental issues. She understood the value that the data could bring and the value of bringing community together. And she has been phenomenal in terms of reaching out to people, bringing people together, helping us with the data, helping us interpreting it. But she never actually had a sensor. So don't leave people behind, I suppose, is a, the message I'm trying to, to convey here when it comes to community building. So once you've done these steps, there's also then the opportunity for scaling up citizen science. Now, what we've seen from uh, Ben's project, the Holmes project, looking at microplastics, is this idea of a pilot and then a rollout. And that allows you to kind of test uh, technology. It allows you to test your processes. It allows you to um, iron out all the bumps. If you're a social scientist, think of it as doing a, a pilot of a survey or a pilot of an interview process before you then uh, kind of launch it and implement it everywhere else. And there's a really fantastic uh, publication uh, done by a guy called Giovanni Maccani, um, which I've given a link to here at the bottom about this idea of scalable by design how you scale your citizen science project so that you can roll it out, you can make it bigger, and you can get more people involved. And Giovanni was actually part of our WeCam project, and a lot of the slides I've just borrowed uh, have actually come from him. Um, so really fantastic pro, uh, uh, report here on this idea of scalable by design. And you're seeing the same different principles or constructs starting to come together. Number one, proof of value. You have to prove that there is value in the approach you are taking and the data you are trying to generate. Number two, is it easy to use? You can't give people high tech technology and expect them to be able to interpret it or use it because now you're limiting the pool of people who can engage with you. So detecting or simplifying the data is really valuable. In essence, if you plug it in, will it play? Will it work? 
But you also have to think about the communities of users. You know, if you're looking at poorer communities or people from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, you have to look at things like energy being used. You know, is there kind of data costs and data transfer? You know, how can you break down these barriers to engagements of these types of projects? Hugely important openness, hardware, software, governance, data, making it all available. Again, this idea of local champions comes forward and then ideas around knowledge sharing, transfer of resources and having kind of consistent narratives and communication throughout. So if you are thinking about a citizen science project, it's often good practice to start small, pilot everything, see how it works and then use this uh, fantastic framework, if you like, to then broaden it, open it out and get more people involved. A lot of text on here, which I'm not going to go through, but I just wanted to point out a piece of work that we did for the Scottish government um, last year, where we actually looked at um, communication principles, particularly around air pollution um, and how you might get people more engaged. And actually, the same principles are really valuable when you're designing communication programs for your citizen science projects. Reflecting on citizens' lived experiences. Well, that will already feed into this kind of stakeholder mapping and co-designing activity. Pre-piloting engagements, that feeds into the scalable by design methodology. Being inclusive, looking at, ta at target groups, bringing a range of actors together. You want to be open and you want to be as inclusive as much as you possibly can. Understanding the social cultural context of what you are trying to do, again, really valuable and is something that you will do as part of this phase one uh, community building activity. Co-creating solutions, this idea of living labs, well, that's embedded into this principle of citizen science, as is indeed citizen lev engagement. Doing things like promoting behavioral changes, well, that's certainly something that's built into the Holmes project that Ben is running, looking at microplastics. This is a really important one, number 10, raising awareness responsibly. And this is probably my biggest uh, anxiety that I have around citizen science is responsible raising of awareness, ensuring the risks are understood and ensuring that data is properly interpreted, interpreted and communicated. Quite often you can get either willful misinterpretation of the data or quite often you can get um, misinterpreted, misinterp misinterpretation of the data because of a lack of knowledge. So number 10 is, is really, really important. Um, from an air pollution perspective, we actually found the communication around the health impacts or the economic impacts had a, had a bigger uh, hit, if you like, rather than talking about something more abstract like concentrations or emissions. Um, change agents, influencers, so this is your local champions. Using local media can be done for stakeholder mapping, raising awareness and recruitment, and then having this ongoing monitoring and evaluation. So, I mean, this, these 15 principles were actually around how you communicate air pollution, but they're actually really, really valuable and they cut across the principles of citizen science. And finally, I'll just mention monitoring and evaluation, hugely important and should be running in the background from day one of any citizen science project. Because ultimately what you want to generate is appropriate metrics, which will allow you to understand the effectiveness and the efficiency of the project and how we look at then traditional pathways to bringing about change resources, the activities undertaken, the outputs we created, what were the short term and the long term outcomes and impacts. And here's various different kind of indicators that we have used across our three projects, number of citizens engaged, the demographic of those citizens, whether it's gender, whether it's income, whether it's educational level, um, what sort of interventions might have emerged from the different case studies? What sort of policy measures might have emerged? And what was the perception of uh, different citizens in terms of what worked and what didn't work? So in doing so, we tend to break the strategy up into three main areas. We look at the technical outputs and the tools. So the technology, the data platform, the data generated generation. 
We look at the user experience, so the experience from the perspective of the citizen scientists or the NGOs or the policy people who might be involved. And then we also look at the experience of the project team. So generating both formative and summative evidence in terms of their experience. And on that final point, I've been working in and around this kind of uh, nexus of science policy and the public for about seven or eight years now. And certainly my own personal experience has changed massively, massively in that time. Before I started working with the public, I was much more, it's all about the numbers. It's all about the data. The data will give us the answer. And what I realize now is the huge value that comes with the local knowledge and the local context to really enrich the data that you are trying to generate and you are trying to interpret. So that is session two in terms of scoping and community building. Again, we can uh, pause here. And I see we've got some questions that are coming through. OK. Um, is there a specific software you use to measure the speed of vehicles through video recording? Or was it made in-house in Bristol? Oops. Let me... Sorry, I've kind of lost the screen for a moment. Ah, here we go. OK, so um, the sensor we used is a sensor called a Telram, T-E-L-R-A-A-M, which was designed by a company in Belgium. Um, Telram is a Dutch word, and it basically translates as abacus or counter. Um, but when you break it in half, tel ram, it uh, translates as window counter. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's looking at the road and then it's counting the vehicles that goes by. Now, so they've designed the, the hardware is obviously kind of Raspberry Pi and a Raspberry Pi camera. So that's already easily available to download. But what Telram did is they, they, designed, the, they designed the algorithms to then um, uh, count the data or to, to count the vehicles. Now, the algorithm is all open access. You can go to the Telram website, you can go to GitHub, you can download the data, you can actually get into it, break it, work with it. They want people to, to work with them in terms of using their data. But to pick up on a specific issue, there isn't any video recording going on. For privacy reasons, although it is a camera, for pri privacy reasons, it's pointing at the road, but it is not... Uh, gathering any images and it is not gathering any video and that is to ensure we're compliant with data protection and privacy and things like that it, it's basically gathering ones and zeros okay it then connects to the um to the wi-fi of the house it's in and it sends data to the cloud so if you go to telram you can download the software if you go to their github uh, github site you can roll your sleeves up and actually get into the software and understand how it works. And you can get a better understanding of how the software is there and how it's being used. OK, next question, representing community. Skills and ex expertise is not only with researchers, but more with unknown citizens. I 100 percent agree with that statement. Um, but researchers never believe or share the final results with community from which they have taken the data. How? Can mutual trust be developed between community partners and researchers? What is your experience? OK, um, so uh, your first statement around um, the knowledge with uh, citizens, totally agree with you. And hopefully I've shown from that kind of presentation the real value in starting from day one and engaging with citizens. Uh, researchers never believe or share the final results with the community from where they have taken the data. That is a problem. It really, really is a problem. We often, as researchers, gather data, and our immediate reaction is, how do we turn this into a peer review paper without recognizing that we actually need to con ensure the legacy of the project by not just, not just using citizens to generate data for us, but actually helping to build capacity, helping them with their data analytic skills and helping them so that there is legacy and there is a, a life and a value beyond the project when the researchers step away. 
And what I'm hoping is when Ben talks in the next few talks, you'll get an understanding of how we have tried to do that by using citizens' uh, local knowledge and by working with the citizens to help them develop their skills so that they become self-sufficient and they can actually take it forward. But it goes back to my point about the, the kind of principles of communication and that you cannot just grab the data and run. You have to then help them interpret it. You have to then help them with their communication messages. And you have to then uh, almost step back from being a researcher and work with them in terms of the simplicity of, of the um, outputs you can create. So, for example, with WeCount, uh, the traffic counting project, what we did was we have uh, the project has just come to an end or coming to an end. And we have created uh, a bespoke report for every single citizen, uh, which summarizes the data that they have gathered from their sensor. Um, we send that back to everyone. We've allowed them to keep the sensor. We've allowed them to keep everything running. We're still keeping a help desk going, albeit in a very light version, so we can keep them involved and keep them running. The point about mutual trust between community partners and researchers, this is where the local champion becomes hugely uh, valuable. Now, what you'll often find is a local community and a local university will already have built up uh, quite a bit of trust over time. Um, through various different projects but it is that local individual who maybe runs a local community group or maybe runs a, a local um a campaign group or maybe runs uh even a, in one case we had a, a local business who was just hugely valuable and going don't worry I, i'll bring the community on board they trust me i trust you they trust me and this is how we can get everyone together uh, Shiva, do you believe your voice can improve the local environment? I think that's a question for everyone. And that's maybe one that we'll keep for the Q&A towards the end. Uh, Margaret, um, interesting presentation. Have you carried out independent validation on the data of the Belgian counter with citizens? Yes, we have. So we have done both manual counts where we got the citizens to go out at peak times and count the data or count the cars going past. And we have also co-located the Telram sensor with pneumatic tubes, so with the, the um, traditional traffic counters. What we found with the pneumatic tubes is that the sensor, it, it's very context specific in terms of the road, but the sensor is about 90% there or thereabouts. It's following a similar trend uh, to the um, pneumatic tubes. Um, it's getting about a 90% kind of performance or, or accuracy. Uh, what we found is the uh, Telram is slightly undercounting, so it's slightly more conservative. With the manual counts, we found that the total count, so remember it's counting cars, large vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians. We found that the total count was really, really good. We're talking about 99% accurate between manual and the sensor. But actually, when you start to break it down, it starts to fall apart a bit. And this is because there were some misclassifications going on. What I mean by that is the sensor is looking at the road and then it's going, oh, that's a car and it's not a car. It's a van or it's looking at the road and it sees two bicycles going past and it goes, oh, they're not bicycles. That's a car. So there was some misclassification going on. But generally, um, it was um, it performed really, really well. And it looks like Ben is already going to talk about this. OK. Um, so, dear, uh, voice of individuals can make a minor difference, if not huge. And yes, I believe my voice does make a difference, starting with educating my family and friends. So I think that's a question or a response back to Shiva. Um, but I think that's a that's a really, really good response. And it's probably one that's worth kind of exploring when we have our, our roundtable discussion at the end. What we learned from our citizens, from our monitoring and evaluation of uh, the WeCamp project, which is the one that is finishing, the other two are, are still in, in early stages, is that the voice of the individual has a huge influence on the people within that individual's proximity. So as Sadir mentioned, family, friends, neighbors, the individual can have a, quite a big influence there. But the voice of the individual can often be lost or is not loud enough 
when it comes to engaging policymakers or industry or other actors within that space. But when you get one person shouting, it often isn't loud enough. When you get two, three, four, five, when you build that community, now you have uh, enough decibels, if we want to use a noise word, now we have enough decibels to be heard and enough decibels and enough noise to actually engage, um, dare I say, policymakers who might be um, traditionally um, not willing to, to engage with this conversation. But there's a, there's a real nuance here in terms of how we go about doing this, because if we have the citizens in one corner and the policy makers are in the, makers in the other corner shouting at each other, that doesn't work. Whereas if we can get everyone together, remember the four actors from that quadruple helix, the citizens, the researchers, the policy makers, and then business, NGOs, and industry, all sitting around a table together and all working together from the very beginning of the process, then it becomes really exciting in terms of that collaborative space. And it becomes really exciting in terms of the new knowledge you can generate, the new partnerships that you can create, and the, the connection that you can, can make between bottom up and top down as two different policy approaches. But maybe we'll explore that uh, a little bit later. Um, OK, I'm going to pause and I'm now going to hand over to Ben. Uh, ben, can you turn your camera and microphone on and we'll get you started? There he is. OK, over to you, Ben. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me one second while I sort this out. So we might go into a tunnel of doom very quickly, but then I'll come out of that into the slide deck. So firstly, can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see that, Ben. Brilliant. OK, so so firstly, um, I do have a, a video embedded in this. Um, sometimes it can work absolutely flawlessly. Sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't and you can't hear something, let me know and we can move on from it. But you'll have these slides and the link is embedded within it so you can go on and um, visit that particular um, video. So really grateful to have the opportunity to to talk through some of these and thanks to Wenda for basically setting this up. So in terms of this session, um, we're talking about practical tips for sensor deployment and a lot of you will have used sensors, etc. So I, I won't go into depth, but it's the practical use for doing this within the citizen science perspective and um, how we can think about what's best to do. So what we'll explore is, firstly, can citizen science address the challenge that you're asking? So that's really important. If you can get your data another way and you don't need citizen science and you don't have to engage with citizens because you're just generating data, then there's no need to do that. If you want to engage with citizens for other reasons, like advocacy, like promotion of a topic, for example, then that's also great as well. We'll think about the pyramid of monitoring quality. Some of the broader considerations around what we should be thinking about when we think about the, the monitoring. Accessibility for citizens as well. If citizens can't access what you're asking them to do, then it's not going to work. The clarity of purpose. So what are you asking them to do? And are you giving that really clear visual instruction? And then the transparency of capabilities as well. And that's of the technology that you're, you're going to use. So firstly, can citizen science address your challenge? It's really important to consider why you're using citizen science in the first place. If you can get it without citizen science, then it'd be best to do that. But think about why you want to use the approach really clearly think about why you want to do it. The benefits of using citizen science include providing citizens with access to science, engagement, and improve that local data. So as Endo was mentioning, there's lots of opportunities to generate lots of really hyper-local data that otherwise you'd you'd miss. So if we think about air quality, and we move on to a couple of the slides later on, in, in the UK, we have the automatic urban and rural network, which is about 167 different um, instruments dotted across a land mass. Now that isn't going to tell you very hyper local data, but local low cost sensors 
or passive samplers can do that with strong caveats around that. You need to be really careful about the data quality if you do go down the local citizen science perspective using low cost sensors. It's important to be really clear about the quality of the data that are generated by the instruments. As Enda was mentioning earlier, um, there's a general anxiety with low cost sensors that if people either willfully or not misinterpret and misuse the data, um, that can be um, quite a painful process, not least for the project, but for those people and for the people they're trying to engage with as well. And it brings conflict in straight away. So you need to be really clear at the start, the quality of the data. But some really interesting um, studies have shown that quality of data generated by citizen scientists can, in some circumstances, be equivalent to professionally gathered data. Um, and another paper has said between 51 and 62% of citizen science projects generated data considered to be accurate from a scientific perspective. I put in some links so you can follow through these um, articles. But those are really interesting. So when we think about citizen science, we don't necessarily need to think about rubbish data and that we're just gathering um, hyper-local indicative data. It can be really, really good. But this depends on the tools you're going to use, how you're going to use them and where you're going to use them. These are all really important considerations. So if we think about air quality in particular, monitoring will methods were very drastically dependent on the pollutant that's being measured and the skill level required by the citizen scientists. So you need to think about the both the skill level and the tools that you're going to use and where you're going to use them, the level of accuracy that you want. So in this table here, for example, right at the bottom there, we've got automatic monitoring stations. So again, if I think back to that automatic and urban rural network in the UK, that is the pinnacle of air quality monitoring in terms of um, regulated devices. They have incredibly good quality assurance and quality control methods. The data are checked, the data are validated, they're really, really robust data sets. But that's going to be really tricky for citizens to use. If you went to a low cost sensor, for example, then I've, I've got a couple here. So I've got a, just in front of me here, a little Nova sensor. So it's a little, little box there, air goes in, it's past air sensor and it generates some numbers. So low cost sensor system, that in terms of validation, verification, QA and QC, probably not so great to be honest, but it generates data. And then if we go down to passive sampling, that is essentially a whole host of different types of uh, methods. So again, in the UK, we use things called diffusion tubes within the network. Um, they are basically a surface for gases to um, permeate, and then you can analyze them to generate data or in the homes under the microscope project, we are using forensic tape. So really, really clean, sticky tape that we can then collect materials that deposit on. So there's lots of these different types of techniques. And again, it depends on what you're trying to measure will result in how you want to measure it. And I think the pyramid of quality is really important when you have those conversations with people about data quality. So I will always put reference analyzers. So again, those in the automatic urban rural network right at the top of the pyramid. They are the high spec, high quality data and instrumentation. You have medium cost sensors, which are okay. They may have gone through certain levels of certification, but they are not those reference analyzer standards and you wouldn't find them in national networks. And then as we've just seen, low cost sensors like this, or bear with me while I disappear off screen, or like this, so that little blue box in there is a, is a plant tower. So another low cost sensor. Back off screen. There we are. So if we think about the reference analyzers in a little bit more detail, they offer the best data quality, really robust evidence, but they're not practical really for citizen science projects because typically they're very expensive. They require high levels of maintenance. There's lots of safety considerations. So you need to, for example, get power into these. And there's um, often a reliance on data from the existing networks. So they're not really mobile. So you couldn't, for example, set up a citizen science project um, and have 12 of these around a school, for example. That's not practical. It would cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds. And there's lots of safety considerations as well. 
So with these is the costs of installation of the power ducts, etc. It's not it's not really practical from a citizen science perspective. There may be things you can do with the data from a citizen science perspective, but that's another thing to the installation of measurement devices in themselves. What might work within a citizen science project is some of these mid-range instruments. So they can be automated instruments. They don't necessarily have um, rigid um, QA and QC protocols, but they can do multiple pollutants at the same time. You're often able to add and remove them. And so, for example, we have a, a Zephyr sensor here and an air quality mesh. Those are two different medium tier sensors. Um, speaking with those who have used both, um, they each have different pros and cons, but for a citizen science project, you could, for example, afford to be able to deploy some of these around a, a neighborhood, around a school, around a hospital, etc., and work with citizens in, in that decision-making process. Where should we put them? How should we analyze the data? What pollutants should we be looking for? So this is the range where you can start to think about working with citizens to deploy some sensors as well. If we go to low cost sensors, which is this is where citizen science can really come into its into its own and where its strengths really lie. They're typically small, low power devices. Costs range from tens to hundreds of pounds for a single pollutant, often up to several thousand pounds for a complete multi-pollutant system. They can be used at fixed locations or handheld. So some sites in the UK, so waste sites or quarries use handheld sensors and they will walk around a site to measure dust, for example. Or people will have um, citizens, you can buy any types of low cost sensors off the internet that you can use yourselves. There's lots of caveats there with the quality of the data, but you can do that. But you do there have an opportunity to apply across a really wide area at a relatively low cost, making it really accessible for citizens to take part in this. Low cost sensors typically haven't undergone any formal type testing process. So they haven't gone and gone, undergone the processes that you will see in those reference analyzers. So again, really big caveats on what the data are telling you. And at the minute, there's only one sensor and uh, that has met official quality assurance, quality control criteria, low cost sensor. Um, and I have put the link to the, to the paper there, to the EU document that summarizes all of these bits of research on low cost sensors. And um, but only one under three thousand pounds has done that. So you can see that they're not quite as robust in terms of data quality as the very, very top spec instruments. And that's understandable, but we need to be aware of that. So we need to be very, very careful of the data quality considerations that we derive from our as Endo was saying, you need to be comfortable with the data you're presenting, you need to be careful about how you present it um, and understand what you are using. And again, it's important for us to emphasize the data quality considerations to citizens. So I've got a slide further on where we set out really, really clearly to citizens in WeCount, the quality of the data that they expect. There's nothing wrong with data that isn't of the utmost standard. It's absolutely nothing wrong with that as long as we use the data within clearly defined contexts and boundaries. And just to give you an example of a low cost method in the bottom right hand corner there is a version of the sticky tape, the forensic tape that we are using in homes under the microscope. So it's a, a gridded system on a Petri dish with big peel here labels. That's all citizens need to do. So there's no installation of things like a Nova sensor, which would be sitting inside a drain pipe with a few cables or the plan tower there, which would need to be cable tied outside. That's all we're asking citizen sci scientists to do here. Put that Petri dish down, peel the label where it says peel here, and at the end, put the lid back on. So that is a really accessible project. But what you can do if you wanted to assess the quality of the instruments that you've got is do some co-location. So if you have a budget and it's valuable for your citizen science project, do some co-location. So I have here is a picture of, um, a very expensive reference analyzer station. And on the top, you will see a, a big MET post, so we generate MET data and a couple of bars on the top of it. And what we are doing here, so this is a project called Umbrella, where it's, it's I think it's the largest low cost sensor network 
at least in the UK and probably elsewhere, it's about seven kilometers long with thousands of sensors in it, but we have some reference analyzers in it. We put low cost sensors on here so we can compare the data from those low cost sensors to reference analyzers as well. And that might help tell a story that your citizens can, can see. They can see the quality of the data. So they know they're not going to go and excessively lobby with poor data. They can look at the data quality and then present that data when they are advocating for change in the context of um, data quality. So what are you trying to measure? That's really important. So before you decide on the sampler, the sensor or the location, consider what pollutant or contaminant that you want to measure. Where do you want to measure? What level of data quality do you need? What resolution do you need? Do you need monthly data or do you need minute by minute data? And does it need power and Wi-Fi? So all of these decisions you can make with citizens, at least the first four. So citizens can be involved in that decision making process with you if you if you are into that type of project. Does it need power and Wi-Fi is really important because you will include and exclude people on the basis of the decisions that you make, whether that's complexity or whether that's accessibility. If a sensor needs power and it needs Wi-Fi to transmit data, then you are going to ex exclude communities and you need to be aware of those communities that you exclude because they may hold really valuable data. So you might want to try and find workarounds for that particular issue. And again, a picture in the bottom right there is a diffusion tube, which is sitting on a drain pipe in the UK that is generating monthly data. So collect data in the diffusion tube, collect samples, send it back to the lab, generate data, and we get concentrations um, from that. Again, really important, is it practical? So you, say you've decided on an instrument that you want to use. Is it, is it usable by citizens? So as scientists, we're often used to working with different types of sensors. And for us, something might be really, really straightforward. Often isn't for others who are new to the discipline, new to the field. So citizens range from highly skilled to unskilled. So in the homes of the microscope project, our pilot phase is very intensive, but that is with highly engaged citizens who are really keen on getting their hands on and process involvement in the development of the of the project essentially other citizens will just want to take that petri dish and pull that sticky tape off and leave it there and then send it back to us so there's two different types of people you can involve in these types of projects but again the practicalities will differ depending on these people so can they construct it i know it that a lot of citizens will really struggle to, to build this type of sensor, this Luftdaten sensor. Whereas with the Homes Under Microscope project again, sticky tape, peel backing off, and you're away. And again, does it need power and Wi-Fi? Really important. Before you spend thousands of pounds on sensors, think about where you're going to use them and the context you're going to use them, because they might be worthless if you can't power them. As I mentioned, different measurement approaches will include and exclude different communities. So you really need to understand who you're engaging with in your sampling design so you don't make those um, early mistakes of uh, accessibility and um, usability. And be really comfortable again in communicating clearly the strengths and weaknesses of your approach and the limitations of your data. Be transparent about what you're doing. There's nothing wrong, as I said, about the quality of the data that you're using. Explain it's a low cost sensor explain that it isn't as equivalent as a 30,000 pound sensor. Citizens absolutely appreciate this honesty and clarity um, in that decision. And when it comes to clarity of purpose, be clear about what you intend to measure, how and why. You can do this by written instructions, workshops, or if possible, video. And I've got a video here of setting up what we're trying to do in the homes project by animation the reason we've done this is because we want to communicate a message in a really simple way so we want the project to be understood in a very very simple way in constructing this video what we've done is we've reached out to communities to say what would be um what, what part of the project would be easy to convey what, what do you find most accessible in terms of understanding what we're trying to do We've also reached out to uh, the Bristol Disability Forum as well in terms of making the video is 
what is it that makes a video accessible to a range of people? So we have subtitles in it. The colours are very particular, so the people with colour blindness can um, see um, the, the video with clarity. Um, there's obviously things that we'll be able to improve, but um, so this is almost a, a community constructed video of the project. So this is only three minutes long, so I promise you it won't be too long. If the sound doesn't start, would someone mind um, shouting out and I'll stop it and then we can, can move on from that. So one second. Can't hear anything, Ben. Okay, so you, you'll have this link. So what I'd suggest is when we share these slides, you can watch this video. The purpose again is to demonstrate that in terms of presenting a project and the methods that you can use, you can use novel techniques. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a sheet. It can be an introductory video that sets out exactly what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. And making these really accessible and um, open to a wide range of people um, makes your project uh, that um, have a little bit more of, a, of an outreach. So as I mentioned, talking about the strengths and weaknesses of projects and approaches is really valuable. It's really powerful and it's really important and citizens will not be ashamed to use something that isn't the very best bits of equipment out there. And within WeCount, we did this. Um, we wanted to show citizens and explain to citizens that um, sensors have their limitations and that's absolutely fine. So I, I've got two slides here that sets this out. So if we think about the Telram sensor, so Enders talked about it in terms of measuring uh, vehicles, traffic, um, they are significantly lower cost than traffic counters. They can be measured using different types of traffic simultaneously. Also the traffic counters are designed for particular vehicle types. It's mass measurement, the fraction of the cost, democratizes data collection. They're not labor intensive. There's no theft of security issues because they're inside your homes. And their local measurement undertaken by local residents adds important context. So here we've set out the strengths of the instrument. So we're not saying low cost sensors are, are rubbish and don't use them. We're saying, look, they've got real value here. These are really good tools. This is how you can use them. In terms of weakness, it's a low cost measurement device. It's got an accuracy and a tolerance compared to actual traffic movements. Sensors don't measure at night. It takes time to calibrate, it can be tricky to install. Some sensors fall in and out of measurement, etc. But as we say here, it's a research project. So we're improving the sensor, we're improving data gathering on a local level, and we've got help desks to better understand the issues and to improve it. So this is what we did with citizens. We shared the strengths, we shared the weaknesses, and that transparency is really, really important for us. So that comes to the end of this session. I think we are slightly behind schedule, so I'm happy to take some, a question now, but we might not want to save them until the end. Would that be sensible? Yeah, I think that's okay. I'm just looking in the chat and I can't see any questions. Um, so again, conscious of time, if it's okay with Shiva, we'll just move on to the next session, which is about data analysis. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Ada, you okay. can begin. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, so again, looking at the looking at the kind of Bristol approach framework, as we can see, we're kind of gradually moving through it. So first one is about building the community, onboarding the citizens and getting them ready. What Ben has just explained, looking at you, looking at it from an air pollution point of view, is some of the, the practicalities of um, getting sensors to people, um, informing them of what works and what doesn't work, um, having help desks, having um, having uh, manuals, user guides, having videos to try and help them through the process. So this next step assumes that we've um, had X amount of days or weeks or months or years of uh, citizen science going on. And what we're going to talk about is uh, the analysis and the interpretation of the data and how we work with citizens. And then most importantly, how citizens can work with us to help us understand this data. So Ben, back to you again. Thanks, Ender. So within this, we look at the citizen engagement with data, data accessibility, 
quick comparison of raw and refined outputs for citizen engagement, use of workshops for user interpretation of data, and then the importance of citizen reflections on, on approaches, because that is really important in improving the next project and the next iteration of, of the work um, that we can do, not just in citizen science projects, but as researchers um, and, and policymakers. So citizen engagement with data is really important. Citizens will have different abilities to engage with the data dependent on its presentation format. So I've given you three examples here of data from WeCount. Now I can see exactly which one would be the most accessible for citizens. The top left, maybe one in a hundred citizens would be able to take that file and turn it into data and do something with it. Top right, again, it's a little bit more refined. But there's still work to do there in terms of trying to interpret the data and understand the data, bearing in mind a lot of us only have a couple of minutes a day to take snapshots of information, so we don't have time to play with Excel files. The bottom picture there is of we count data on the website that are all citizen see accessible data tells you exactly what you're seeing when you're seeing it, um, and that is a nice accessible form of data presentation. So again, the presentation of your data is incredibly important in who you're working with and how citizens engage with you. Make it as easy as you possibly can. And again, uh, reinforcing that, make that data really clear for citizens so they can look at it, see what it's telling them, and then move on, because that's what a lot of citizens do. They, in these projects, in citizen science projects, you'll have maybe 10, 15% that are very, very engaged and will spend a long time looking at your data. Most will be there for fleeting participation. So make the data really um, accessible for them and visualization of data is a really good way of doing that. Easier data are to engage with, the wider your pool of available citizens. Make your data accessible as well. If citizens are generating the data, then empower them, make them feel that they own it and they should own it. It's their data, they are generating it with you. If you can, make it open to other people. So for example, this is a snapshot from the WeCount website. So there's a sensor on Lansdowne Road in Cardiff. They are generating data. They have access to their data, but so do other people. Similarly, in homes under the microscope, people who will be taking pictures of their samples and uploading it onto our platform will be sharing that data with not just other users, other citizen scientists, but with anyone who wants to interact with that data. So again, make that data open and available. It's that transparency, which is really powerful. If you're working alongside citizens and not citizens working for you, you will get a lot more out of the project and you'll get a lot more buy-in. It's more of a partnership, more than a directive. A couple of examples here. We've done this with citizens. We've used data to then look at some patterns. So we've looked at data from Somerset Street. So this is readily acceptable data. So if you went on the weekend platform now, you could do it. We look at Somerset Street in Cardiff. Couldn't really see much pattern between um, lockdown rules in the UK. So when lockdown happened, different activities were ceasing at different times and then reopening at different times. And there wasn't really that much visible on a very small street. On a really busy street, we started to see um, some patterns in the data. So when lockdowns were um, lifted, you could see the amount of traffic uh, was returning um, at different stages. So using low cost sensors, we were able to see the impact of um, lockdown changes on traffic movements in Cardiff on particular roads. So that was really interesting that we were able to do that with these types of sensors. In terms of uh, homes under the microscope, this is an example of the approach that we're using. So people upload their pictures. This is only 30 seconds long. Upload their picture to a platform, to our platform. Click process and it would generate lots of information. Now, the first thing you can see here is that that data looks quite complex from a citizen's perspective. How do they interpret that if they're not from a the a research background, a particle background, or a, a science background. Well, what we've tried to do is to make it a little bit easier for people. So when they upload their picture and it gets processed, they have information like this instead. So it's around particle color, particle size, maybe some particle brightness information. 
the number of particles of which there are fibers, for example, so, so to make it much more digestible when you have that fleeting engagement with your data. And workshops are really powerful in understanding and interpreting data. So what we've done is at Project Inception, inform the citizens of the data being generated. Again, it's quality, which is really important, and it's meaning. So what are we trying to actually generate? During the project, what we've done is offer data workshops to present current findings across different parts of Cardiff. And as part of that, we had citizens presenting their data as well. And at the end of the project, have wrap up workshops so you can bring everyone together and say, this is what we found. This is what we've learned. This is what we're going to do next. Provide the space for citizens to contribute to those different types of presentations as well. And I have a slide at the bottom here. So it sets out um, two of our citizen scientists, Eva and Mark. They took the data that they were generating and we invited them to a workshop in which we'd framed it as a citizen-led data workshop. So citizens would present the data that they have found using their sensors to other citizens as well. So it was that citizen buy-in, which is really important. They are often valuable because they provide an opportunity for citizens to present at a workshop. So citizens might not often have had the opportunity to present before um, or interpret data or talk about data. Citizens know their local environment better than you or I. So if I think of Cardiff, I'm from Wales, but I'm from a different part of Wales to Cardiff. I'm not from Roth, wherever Mark was from. They know Roth better than I will, better than Ender will, although Ender lives pretty close to Roth. And it's really good that they can understand that local context provides a community perspective as, as well. So it's not us imposing a perspective. It's not us saying, oh, look, lockdown has made a difference to your to your street. Eva and Mark may well say, no, it hasn't. We're just looking at it in a different way. It was actually a road closure, for example. So that local perspective is very important. Provides an opportunity for communities to develop and bond over their data as well. So some of our citizens have developed uh, WhatsApp groups where they communicate over the data and uh, have a new community network. And citizens will often look at data in completely different ways to how we um, anticipate people will look at data. So just to touch on the um, citizen evaluation of the sensor. So Mark in particular looked at the data from the counter on the right hand side and then he did a manual count. So he sat for one hour in his window, looked at the number of cars, trucks, bikes and pedestrians that went past and then looked at the data from his counter at the end of it. And in terms of the overall count, there was largely similar amounts, but the counter, for example, was overestimating the number of, of bikes um, and underestimating the number of cars, for example, in this instance. But in terms of numbers, it was really good. And for others, it's, it's pretty good as well. So it was nice that the citizen had gone and done that himself. Again, making data available for everyone so it's really easy and clear to use. Websites are really good for doing that because people can click in, explore, click off on whatever else they're browsing. And at the start, consider your citizens and tailor the data availability to their needs. What do they need from the data? If you have that opportunity, do it. And, and through homes, we are doing that. We're asking citizens, is this good enough for you? What else do you need? How else do you want to visualize the data? And a couple of examples, again, we count on the right hand side, and this is data from a Zephyr. So no citizens have been involved in the creation of this data, but they can see concentrations of pollutants against um, the time, essentially. Something that's really important in data, again, is the perspectives of citizens. And I'm just going to touch on this quickly because we can look at it in the, in the next session, is asking citizens not only what do they enjoy, but how can we improve it? Because we need to improve things. We don't just deploy something and then leave it. We want to make things better. So within we count, citizens said being part of a research project was really valuable for them. 27% said they felt that they were making a difference. 17% said the favorite aspect was gathering evidence to campaign with. And 11% the favorite part was the technology. So again, you have some people who are really interested in the technology. Some just want to be part of the project as well. In terms of the experiences was fun, etc. In terms of technology, they were satisfied to see the data seeing that the data is publicly available and that the sensor is not expensive. And they thought the project was well thought through and very well organized. So these feedback 
uh, bits of feedback are really valuable for developing the next project or refining the project. If it's a two stage project, this information from the pilot can help you refine the further rollout. So that co-creative part is a strong tool to use. In terms of knowledge, so right at the start of the first session, I was mentioning why engage with citizens. If you don't need to, why bother? If you want to impart information with people, it can have a significant impact. So in terms of knowledge, for example, a lot of our citizens said there was a massive improvement, a lot of improvement, some improvement in their knowledge of the topic. And for us, that's brilliant. We've been able to share and work with citizens in developing tools, knowledge and data, which is fantastic. Asking them what didn't work so well again, really good. Yeah, that we set out why the sensors weren't as good as reference analysis at the start. The data accuracy was something that they um, flagged as being a challenge for them. In terms of issues, the position and the weight of the sensor was a challenge, loss of connections, etc. But what this can do is can help inform the development of a next generation of that particular sensor as well. And then what can we do better? Similarly, we can make the data easier to understand. That wasn't very um, high on the what can we do better, which is good. Um, the technology could be better, more ways to be involved, because again, this is a sensor. And as we were talking about earlier, some can use these types of things. So this isn't a Telram, this is a particle sensor. Some can't. Finally, which feeds into the next session, 32% said they would um, take action or willing act by lobbying, connecting with citizen campaign groups and setting up air quality sensors. So 32% of those who took part are going to take action with their data, which is absolutely great. And that's what we want to see. So that's the end of this session. Any questions? Yeah, ben, there is a one question uh, from yeah. uh, uh, Krishna Prasad from Fluidine. Uh, mobility, instrumentation, power, connectivity, uh, front end, back end tools, analytics, quite versatile and interesting. How do you think the the funding as been can be sourced for all this? So th this is a good question. So you want to do it within. So for, for us, from a research perspective, we would do this within the confines of a research project. So the design, the implementation is all within a research window, research project. Um, homes under the microscope, that website development, that analytical tool is being designed um, with citizens in mind, with a local website developer and with a colleague who has expertise in machine vision, for example. So we're using machine vision to be able to do those bits of characterization. That sits within a research project. It's a citizen science research project. So you could think of it um, if you wanted to do something similar to this. Um, if it fits within a, a research landscape, then that's brilliant. If you're able to source funding elsewhere, maybe uh, government, for example, then that might be an opportunity as well. But in terms of homes under the microscope, all of that work is undertaken within the banner of the research project. Does that answer the question? If, if I can just jump in there as well, I think I think it goes back to an earlier point I mentioned about innovation rather than invention. Um, you don't need to invent you don't need to invent the Telram, you know, the traffic counting sensor. You don't need to invent an air quality sensor. There are a huge number of these already available and already out there. So a lot of the instrumentation, the power, the front end, the back end tool, the analytics, a lot of them are already there. Yeah. So rather than inventing them innovate from them so take their instrumentation take their front end and back end tools take what's already there off the shelf and adapt it for your purposes and your needs and in doing so then the funding becomes more about the rollout and the implementation of the project rather than funding for the creation of new tech or new yeah. ideas and as ben mentioned then we've got funding from a number of different streams uk funding or uk research authorities uh, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, the big kind of uh, European and global funding stream. National governments have funded projects like this. So the funding can be quite varied, but don't feel like you're you're starting with a blank sheet of paper or, or, a, or a, you need to come up with a, 
a new idea. The, I would argue the majority of what you need is already out there. Okay, Ben. So we've generated a lot of data. We've analyzed a lot of data. We've looked at interpretation. Next step, Ben. Okay, so if you bear with me, we'll actually open up one final slide. One final session. So this is around how citizen scientists can transition from being a citizen scientist to citizen advocate. So this um, is an interesting perspective. It's also a challenging perspective. So I'm just going to set out things to think about and then touch on some of the advocacy that has happened um, in WeCount. But a lot of this is around thinking about how to advocate because it can be a challenge. So what is an advocate, the types of advocacy, the message we want to convey, overcoming challenges, avoiding exclusion, and then influencing the decision makers. So first of all, what is an advocate? They help others express their views and wishes and stand up for their rights. We're collectively and identifying solutions, inviting all parties to listen to each other's problems. This is research to speak truth to the public and decision makers. They work often work within the system to deliver change projects. And there's three components with relationships, sound policy and respect. So advocacy can be uh, complex to master. And it's not necessarily straightforward, but everyone can be an advocate. Some things are really easy to advocate for, but if you want to master advocacy, that is a, a challenge. So why do we advocate for change? So there's often a frustration with the status quo, a desire for something better, to amplify marginalized voices, to build relationships with government and to change attitudes, behaviors or policy. So we advocate for change from an air quality perspective. We know that our air needs to be cleaner and we will advocate for that using research. And we will do that through different platforms. We'll do it through workshops. We'll do it through conferences. We'll do it through meetings. We will advocate for change from an air quality perspective with the research that we've done underpinning our decisions and our perspectives. So what can citizens do? So advocacy can be individual and it can be a collective action. So citizens can research and investigate and we can facilitate that through our research projects. So working with citizens, we can work with them on that research, on that investigation. So you might, for example, in terms of a citizen science project, initially got to citizens and say, what do you want to investigate? So this is the framework. We want to think about air quality, but what is it about air quality that really interests you? Is it the measurement of pollutants? Is it people's perceptions? Is it that policy landscape? You can build that um, citizen science project from the ground up from an advocacy perspective. You can raise awareness or public engagement and protest. You can mobilize and organize like-minded people as well to draw them together and build communities. You can engage groups of people that are not like them to understand their needs and motivations. So, so trying to break through kind of societal silos can often be a really powerful way of spreading messages. Because often we get messages from the same um, channels as we're used to. We will go to a particular website for our news. That is the news that we receive. Others will go to different websites with different news, for example. So we end up in different silos receiving different information about the same topic often. And speak to and build relationship with decision makers, either in person or via consultations or on social media, etc. And take part in participatory democracy. So neighborhood forums, clinics, citizen assemblies, for example, or do some fundraising. And just a segment that was taken out of week out. This is a comment from one of the citizens was it does help one feel more engaged with the community. We have a WhatsApp group for the street with some good people on it. And I advertised Telram on there. So what they'd done was they'd used the sensor. They then built a community across their neighborhood. And we're talking about the sensor there. And we know from particular streets that multiple people on that street want the sensor to be used there. So building up that community, generating information is, is a really interesting form of advocacy that's been undertaken by citizens there. So views and wishes are not always heard or well received. As I mentioned, we often get messages from particular silos that we've been tuned into. So it's hard for people to hear particular messages. 
and often we may get a message that conflicts with our perspective and it often can be um, poorly received. So it's important to understand the relationship between the message and the messenger and those receiving it. So you may generate a message through citizen science. You may be communicating the message as the messenger, but you may be communicating it to those that might not want to hear what you are saying or might not be able to hear what you are saying. And that's where these personal psychological factors can affect how messages are communicated. So identities, we all cling to them. We often have strongly held beliefs and thoughts, even if they are not beneficial to us, but they are strong personal psychological factors that are really challenging to, to break through. So just as an example here, these are some messages. So the message is ban cars, cycle and work from home. Now, within my family, I could share this message with several of them and they would go, don't be daft. I'm not going to do that. Some would go, that's interesting, but it's not going to work. And maybe, I think maybe one or two will go, oof, I'm on board. So you need to think about the message that you're trying to communicate because that will put people off straight away if you're basically saying, don't ever do anything like this, ever. Because firstly, it's not relevant to people's everyday lives. It doesn't relate to what they value or are sensitive to their needs and motivations. So you need to think about that message that you're trying to convey to people. What we need to try and do is to find a way of communicating that type of message in a cleaner way that is in tune with people's everyday lives. So how do we work together for cleaner air for our children and healthier, happier streets where kids can play? So that type of message is a little bit gentler than the ban cars, cycle everywhere, work from home. It's about what do we all value together? What is that value that we, we share? Change is really hard. There's cognitive bias that we hold and that's there for comfort and convenience. And we do hold on to our thoughts, beliefs and identi identity, which can often manifest as emotional triggers. So you often see this with certain messages. Social media is a great place to see this, um, although it can be quite toxic, is you will share thoughts and beliefs and someone who doesn't share will react quite negatively towards that message. So you can see this type of um, thing happening. So you need to be aware that it does happen in communicating data as well. What you can do is you can try and break down some of these uh, barriers. So you can facilitate space for peers to discuss issues safely, openly and free from judgment. You can actively listen, you can discuss the challenges. Are they structural? Are they limiting beliefs? Are they time, etc. We emphasize that we all have capacity to change show how slow and incremental change can happen. You can share a story using facts and told in various ways and using inclusive and encouraging language. So saying to someone, we're going to ban cars is different to saying to someone, how do we work together to make our communities better for the future? You can positively reinforce beneficial behaviors. So you can, if you see someone who's just got into cycling, you can really pat them on the back and go, yeah, that's, that's great. Well done. And positive messages like that, really subtle ones, can have a, a big difference. And pay particular attention to people who are in life transitions, because as you're transitioning from maybe one neighborhood to another, from one job to another, from one city, town, country to another, you're often more open to those changes. So I've put a picture down here, um, which is uh, of a sculpture that we made back in 2016 under another project called um, upstream and that was around healthy urban environments as part of that we wanted to communicate air pollution but often when we communicate air pollution it's the same type of people who we engage with people who are interested in air pollution and know about air pollution so in this instance what we did was made this sculpture using a, a local artist using coal quartz and pyrite it's quite big it, it's quite evident it really stands out but we put it in the middle of bristol city center and what this did it was really interesting it drew people who wouldn't have, if we had a banner there that said, come and talk to us about air quality, they wouldn't have come near us. They wouldn't have wanted to speak to us. They'd have ignored us. With this sculpture, they came over and they said, what is this? What is it about? And then we were able to start to talk about air pollution with people who would not have considered the discussion in the first place. So interventions like this can start to open up conversations with people you wouldn't expect or wouldn't be able to reach normally. 
What you can also do is to nudge. So nudges purposefully disrupt their environments to change social norms. So for example, they include guerrilla style cycling lanes painted during pandemic where citizens went out and painted cycle lanes on the road. Some of them have been made permanent or musical steps. So the steps weren't playing music, but they were painted in ways that made them look like a piano keys and people were drawn to them because it looked interesting. So you can influence people within organizations and homes, as we heard in the chat box earlier, having conversations with family members is great. You can um, often influence people because in family because they trust, they have, you have their trust. Uh, within organizations too, you can, you can do that. And you can have peer support and role models. So often role models can carry messages further than um, the best research project ever can. So think about that as well. And then think about what policy change is required to make it stick. So it's all good having this type of change. So if we think about those um, lanes, those guerrilla cycle lanes, there's a current push in the UK to increase cycle lanes. Citizens painting guerrilla cycle lanes was both bought into as uh, really interesting from a public perspective, but the policy landscape was there to allow some of these to stay in place. So think about that as well. So just have a think. So this is an opportunity for us to just think very quickly about those types of barriers. So here we are, a 30 something single man in love with a really fast, flashy car, loads of money, wants to look good with the car, just moved to a new city. Who would he listen to? So, so it's really challenging to do that. Is who would he listen to? How would he change? So for example, and this is a, an off the cuff example, and it might not necessarily work because we don't know this person. It might be that if you show him, people like him scooting, maybe there's a Lamborghini scooter somewhere and that costs a lot and looks flashy, he might buy into that. How it's leading to success in other aspects of life. So scooting to work allows him to park in the most prestigious parking space, for example. Um, that might be it. It might be e-scooter charging at the gym, outside pubs and work, might give him that incentive to, to do that as well, the discounts, etc. But it's really challenging to break down people's perceptions when they're so heavily entrenched. So avoid exclusion, marginalised voices. So as we said earlier, banned cars, for some people, driving is unavoidable. They have to drive. People are doing shopping, taking kids to school and other things. They have to drive if the public transport isn't there. Others can't afford to have nice cars. So telling everyone to buy cars or electric cars excludes a very significant part of society. Involve marginalized voices from the outset. So support people. So people like to be considered within groups of people like them. So for example, when I mentioned the homes under the microscope video, we've included as many marginalized voices as we can in the design of that video through um, Bristol Green Capital Partnership who have outreach into lots of communities. So people can feel that there's some buy-in from people like them and co-create solutions with community stakeholders. I say all community stakeholders here, it's really difficult to, to do all, but with community stakeholders. Messages may not be well received if we fail to include who are marginalized voices uh, in the decision-making process. In the UK, there's an enormous inequalities um, both from health perspective, from exposure to air pollution perspective, from an access to green space perspective. That, that shouldn't be the case. If we include marginalised voices, we can understand them better, we can make life better for, for everyone. Influencing decision makers is particularly hard for citizens to do on their own, so they may need to do that as part of an organisation. You need to consider who you need to influence, you need to analyse their motivations and their basis of their power and how your um, advocacy power fits into that So, in order to understand the best way to influence them. Spend time getting to know the right people, develop well-crafted narratives using data um, behind that, and then find the right opportunities to engage as well. But this is particularly hard for citizens to do individually. As a collective, it's easier. And as I mentioned earlier, and which is really important, 32% of citizens through WeCount said they were going to do some form of advocacy, which is fantastic. So types of advocacy from WeCount. So this is some off, off our social media. So we have different people within social media. Um, so a Roth called Play Street looked at the data during a closure, a street closure where they had a play street so children could play in the street, could see massive differences in their data. 
they were shouting about this from the rooftops on social media to say, look how good this is in giving that space for children to play. Another citizen was looking at doing a survey of the cars on their street and how that related to CO2 and tonnage emitted per year. Again, really interesting. And what we can do as well through our Twitter account for the project is to try and amplify some of these voices as well. So um, Sarah Crosby, who presented in our workshop, as she was presenting, we were amplifying some of the messages as she was conveying from her data around speeding. So there's citizen advocacy, there's amplification that we can do as projects um, as well. So within WeCant, there was specific targeted advocacy examples. So in particular is to support schools with active travel and science and technology, um, engineering maths activities, monitoring data for the reopening of a particular street um, in Cardiff, which is contentious. So a big street that goes past the castle was, was largely closed off during the pandemic, and now it was reopened. And supporting Cardiff low traffic neighborhoods feasibility study as well. So all of these different ways we can use data in Cardiff to advocate. If at first you don't succeed, be open to feedback. If, you, if needed, try again with another person or organization, but learn from each encounter. Advocacy is really positive, can be really challenging, can be really frightening, but everyone can do it and it will in the end reap its rewards. So thank you for that. Um, are there any questions? So there's there's two questions, Ben. Um, oh, so there's two questions. Um, one is around accepting the difference in data quality collected by citizen science and an expert. I think I might hold that question back until after the next talk, because I believe we're going to discuss the hybrid air quality monitoring network next. But the question for you, Ben, if Ben is um, barring self-motivated citizens and the one who can be easily educated. How do you try and work with neutral citizens? That's a really good question. So something that we're doing with the Homes Open Microscope project is that a lot of people, and you'll find this across any neighborhood, lots of people have very little time to, to think about a particular new topic. So with us, we're looking at airborne microplastics. That's a really new idea, a new concept. What we're trying to do initially is to raise awareness so you want people to have short exposures so they can think about it and they can go, ooh, that's really interesting. And then in terms of engagement, what you want to do with those types of people is to give them the opportunity to engage on, on however intensely they may wish. So whether it's through really intense engagement or whether it's fleeting engagement. So if, in terms of that wider engagement with th those, in inverted commas, neutral, we all have our different perspectives, but I think neutral is a, a, a good term, is give people the opportunity to learn and participate at their own pace in their own time. Um, try and make things simple and easy to engage with. Um, try not to, to put people off with too much complexity. So those neutral participants will find something really interesting, really valuable and easy to do. They are more likely to buy into that message and that perspective. Does that answer the question? I think it does. And if, if I can also add on top of that is find the thing that motivates the individual. Yeah. So someone with an environmental, someone who's got an environmental background or is is self-motivated already is a, an environmental advocate or campaigner. If you're doing a citizen science project around air pollution, well, they're going to be pretty easy to 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 onboard and to make part of the project. But for somebody who doesn't come from that background or that interest, if you can find that little nugget, that little something that connects to their lived experience and to their day to day lives, they may be much more in interesting or willing to engage. So maybe you don't talk to them about air pollution concentrations or, or um, uh, chemical speciation of PM10 in the atmosphere. Maybe you talk to them about the health effects of air pollution. Maybe you talk to them about the cost benefits that can be brought about by having cleaner air and having um, uh, ha having a, a healthier urban environment for, for people to, to, to live in. Maybe you talk to them about alternative modes of transport or heating or whatever it might be. And by doing so, and not just talking to them, but also listening to them, 
you'll nearly always find that something that will connect back to the topic you're particularly interested in. Air quality, for example, health is nearly always the one thing that connects with someone because everybody knows somebody who suffers from asthma or suffers from COPD or can, can be uh, influenced by the effect of air pollution. So often it's about finding that, that little nugget, that little something that will actually um, empower them or embolden them to get involved. Okay, Shiva, back to you, I think. Um, ben, if you can stop sharing your screen and over to you, Shiva. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Inda and uh, Ben for uh, interesting uh, uh, presentations uh, covering a lot of aspects for uh, citizen sciences. Uh, so uh, we have now, uh, uh, Professor Kare uh, would like to introduce about uh, a hybrid air quality monitoring network, and uh, all of you uh, know that Professor Kare was, uh, you know, uh, part of the air commission set up by government in the past, and he has a wide experience. Uh, since he is having some other connectivity issues, so and also some other assignments, so he has shared his uh, thought uh, through a video. Uh, just to uh, brief out uh, some of his, uh, uh, you know. Uh, biography uh, can uh, suvarna can you just introduce to uh, professor kare yes sir yeah, i'll just uh, read out uh, as uh, professor kare uh, is uh, uh, is currently working as a professor ma of emeritus uh, in uh, iit delhi in department of civil engineering uh, he has uh, more than 140 referred articles and four books and uh, six contributing uh, uh, chapters in several you know leading uh, publishers and 40 uh, technical reports and uh, he is part of uh, numerous uh, committees uh, uh, many ngt uh, committees uh, uh, and uh, he is a sort of person uh, in uh, almost all uh, air quality management uh, uh, you know uh, requirement in the country so uh, as i said uh, due to uh, some other uh, commitments uh, he has uh, sent uh, his uh, thoughts uh, through a video i asked uh, request ashwin to play that uh, later on uh, sachin will going to briefly introduce about uh, uh, hybrid network uh, air quality monitoring Good afternoon, uh, participants and experts uh, who are uh, attending this uh, uh, very interesting workshop on the adaptability of citizen science in Asian countries. Uh, my task is to introduce you the talk which is going to be given by my project scientist, Mr. Sachin Dhawan. Uh, the title of the talk today is the Hybrid Air Quality Monitoring Network. Um, this uh, network, which we call it as a hybrid, is integration of sensors and the conventional reference, uh, you know, uh, monitoring uh, equipments, which is being used in almost all over the India, in all the urban cities. Now, the problem of the present network using the reference instrumentation, uh, which are fixed, is that their spatial resolution is not very high. Second, the, they are very complex and uh, technical instrumentation, which a citizen uh, who is the final uh, you know, sufferer of the air quality is not able to understand their functioning as well as the, their data interpretation. So that is why the citizens uh, led air quality management is lacking in India. And citizens are important stakeholders. Without citizens participation, who are sufferers, who are receptors, final receptors, it is not possible for us to have a good policy, effective policy, 
and effective and efficient air quality monitoring network. Next is that next decade or a coming decade is an urban decade. Urbanization is taking very fast and it is getting a challenge now for us, for all of us. The capacity of the urban local bodies is very underrated. It has to be strengthened. And it is the citizens who is constantly in touch with most of the urban local bodies because they see not only the uh, you know uh, the the, sanita the, sa the the sanitation and other uh, aspects which are closely related to citizens. So citizens feel very comfortable in talking with the urban local body, but unfortunately, presently they are not well equipped with the air quality management or air quality monitoring or any part of the uh, air quality uh, you know uh, control and uh, monitoring. So the capacity building has to be required with citizens' participation. So the easiest way for involving citizens in air quality management is in the one, uh, in, in, in the one task of air quality management, that's the monitoring. Because monitoring, the citizens take a lot of interest. It is not very complex. It is not very you know, uh, technically uh, uh, you know, difficult to uh, understand by the citizens even if he is not a science-based, uh, having not a science-based background. So they take a lot of interest to learn and to use these monitoring uh, equipments uh, in field if they are not very complex in nature like the present fixed station monitoring networks. And so for this, sensors are the best alternative, very attractive alternatives for uh, the citizens uh, who, you know, who are the important stakeholders. However, there are constraints for uh, regulatory bodies as well as for the technical persons and experts with the sensors. But what are those con constraints? Their calibration, which is a very challenging task. Their spacing criteria among the two, uh, between the two, uh, you know, uh, reference and uh, uh, conventional fixed monitoring stations. What should be their spacing criteria? Their uh, a performance evaluation uh, protocol uh, that is not there at the moment. Census data communication network, how it should be designed, how data should be transferred, and how data should be uh, interpreted. So these are some of the challenges or constraints, I should say, which most of the sensors being used in India, and not only in India and other countries, that they are lacking. So once these challenges, these constraints are solved. I think sensors are the, a very attractive uh, alternative for citizens to make them motivated and participate in the air quality uh, you know, management uh, task. So in that case, what this talk, talk is going to describe that how we design the uh, hybrid air quality monitoring network where sensors are integrated with the two, uh, you know, within the two uh, reference, uh, you know, uh, com complex and uh, present conventional uh, monitoring uh, machines, and how, what should be the performance uh, evaluation criteria, what should be the spacing criteria, how uh, they should be calibrated, and many other uh, points which this talk is going to tell. So, uh, so that this can be used as an attractive alternative for the uh, you know, citizens-led air quality uh, management. So that is what uh, uh, this talk is going to tell. And now I'll, I'll uh, hand over to Mr. Sachin Thawan, who is going to uh, present uh, this, this uh, topic and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, tell that how this hybrid uh, air quality monitoring network is useful for motivating the citizens to participate in uh, the air quality management uh, criteria, uh, uh, work in uh, Asian countries like India. Thank you. Yeah. 
Sajin, uh, you can share your slide and could you please uh, briefly present uh, so that uh, we can uh, take some time for uh, discussion? Sure, 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 sir. Uh, is my slide visible now? It's come. Yes. Thank you, thank you, uh, Shiva, sir. Uh, it was a very interesting session by Professor uh, Hayes and Dr. Penn. It was a very good session learning about the, their experience about citizen science and their involvement in monitoring and uh, air pollution abatement and uh, every aspect of air pollution management. Uh, this talk is about hybrid air pollution or quality monitoring network. I think the user has summarized that uh, about this network very uh, finely. I'll share a few things about this network, starting with the urban air quality management network. If you see the air air monitoring lies at the center of this framework. All these air uh, source apportionment studies, the air quality uh, air quality modeling, the health impact studies, and interventions for the control of air pollution depend on the air monitoring network. And currently, we need to the the network is not so wide, and we need to scale up this network. And HAQM, and that is hybrid air quality monitoring network, is a good option to scale up this network and use the data. For different purposes and involvement of citizen citizen is also imperative with this air quality monitoring using sensors. Now, what is hybrid air quality monitoring network? I have given a reference image at the right. It represents what is a, what a hybrid air quality monitoring network look like. It includes the data from our fixed stations such as CAQMS, the manual stations, these are uh, industrial CEMS industrial monitoring stations that is satellite data can also be used for various purposes such as the calculating aero aerosol optical depth for, for pm 2.5 and we can use sensor for uh, particulate matter data and for gaseous sensors when we can use these sensors and satellite data with the already established cqms to augment the data quality and the spatial temporal resolution of the data will also increase at very low cost as the cost of sensors is comparatively very less in comparison to BAM or any other station. Why there is a need of HAQMN? In order to understand the need of HAQMN, I have represented the CAQMS station of Delhi City in green colors. These are the CAQMS stations of Delhi City and the blue one, these are the sensors, sensor networks. We have represented it is for representational purpose. We have not actually calculated that this much sensors is required for this city. The CKMS are distributed sparsely across the city. We can see there are various station uh, nearby these areas. But in uh, the North Delhi or East Delhi or West Delhi, the stations are sparsely distributed. And there is a need of sensor networks or other station at these areas. But the question is how we are going to place these stations these uh, um, uh, HAQMN in these areas. Due to this, uh, the, since the station is sparsely distributed, the diffuse sources, we all know that that sources of air pollution in Delhi, or maybe we can say that in India are diffused and we are not properly, we are not able to quantify the proper, so proper sources of air pollution and sometimes they are neglected. If you see the since the uh, since our network is sparsely distributed, the hotspot identified are you are identified using the data of the stations already established. And very there due to this uh, mismanaged network, we can say there are many various hotspots which are still not identified yet. The purpose of HAQM is to increase the spatial temporal resolution of the data and involve citizens in air quality management. But not for the regulatory purpose. Since the since there are no data quality objectives for sensors in India right now, the data cannot be cannot be used for the regulatory purposes. Now this this is the components of HAQMN. There are majorly three components: sensors. It can be any type of sensor, uh, like the photometer, nephelometer, optical particle counter, and there is one more sensors being developed by ITD and IITM tip. Sensor air, which works on bright fill imaging assisted sensor. Another is using uh, satellite data to fill data gaps. Another, uh, the third one is to capture the diffuse sources. We can use drones and we can mount sensor on these drones just to uh, check the real time uh, measurement of pollution from different diffuse sources. Now, 
since professor khare has told about the various proverb various shortcomings of this html how we can strengthen the h and sir with the already a step cms there are numerous technologies available in market such as optical particle counters nephelometers photometers and i have just uh, talked about bright field imaging assisted pm sensor but all of these technologies are not they do not have exactly same results some sensors are very very uh, very well calibrated and good for maybe for let's say let's say sensor is made in china it might it might be very good for use in china but the uh, climatological conditions in india are very different in india we experience a very of variety of climates ranging from tropical in south to temperate and alpine in uh, himalayan north region the sensor need to able to adjust into this varying climatological condition also there is a very strong need for performance evaluation protocol for these sensors currently the indian market is flooded with various different type of sensors which might not be giving the perfect data that, that we might need so there is a strong need for this performance evaluation protocol now the involvement of citizens in hkm the involvement of citizen at each and every step is required from the sighting of the sensors to data quality and capturing these sources at various places the public landscape is changing and we need to think of new mechanisms such as collaborating involving citizens in uh, the decision making process in analysis process as uh, described by professor hayes and dr ben these are the data quality objectives given by usep uh, eu EU and uk if you see the data quality objectives given by us epa there are various like precision bias linearity error but in for eu or uk they only talk about the daily average completeness of the data and uncertainty however if you look at the clearly the uncertainty included by eu and uk includes most of these parameters while calculating the uncertainty also there is one more thing the us epa protocol uh, uses this the reference stations as error free whereas eu and uk include these stations have this more reference monitor has some uncertainty in their data and it is included into the uh, calculation of this parameter now the main problem is for calibration of these sensors there are various approaches for calibration of the sensor the sensors generally depends it is shown in this right picture here the input layer uses the pm raw data humidity and temperature the the calibration factor is strongly dependent on temperature and rh which are highly variable in indian conditions diurnally as well as seasonally let's say if we talk about light scattering sensors the refractive index so for in light scattering sensors the refractive index depend upon composition of particles whether it be carbon silica so as the calibration factor developed on one kind of dust for let's say arizona dust or soot dust might not be relevant in other location so that's why we there is a strong need of very uh, reliable data and for that reliable data we need to have properly uh, calibrated sensors which can be used in different environment environment conditions in india it can be automated using the machine learning approach like they say there is a n artificial net, neural network approach using the hidden layer for calculations of for calibrating calibrating the data using humidity and temperature this is a slide from our previous uh, work done it is done under professor Sha, uh, professor shiva sir and it is a wireless network made on sensor air network it uses gsm module for the data communication the data sent from the sensor is encrypted and it it decrypts at the server end and there is a cloud platform where anyone with username and password can easily access data this type of network is required if you if you want to employ a hkml in a city network let's say for about delhi now way forward for india there is a strong need for development of sighting criteria for sensor placement and location identification primarily in urban settings and thereafter we will also look for rural settings second is refinement of sensor performance evaluation protocol it is submitted by the sensor team iitd and iitm team led by professor khare to moefcc ministry of environment forest and climate change 
after uh, the refinement of this protocol, there is a strong need for pilot testing of the HEQML network for addressing the practical problems in establishing the network. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Sachin, for the interesting presentation. Uh, we'll just give a one minute, uh, you know, relaxation for all of you too, because there are a lot of things uh, being discussed. Uh, uh, Professor Enda's presentation was so excellent. And uh, uh, William also gave several uh, information and data analytics. Uh, so uh, just to quickly, uh, you know, uh, we'll just uh, take a minute break and uh, probably we will try to look at it. The three questions and probably uh, uh, we will, uh, you know, start discussing. And maybe the first question maybe we, sh we should think about, uh, you know, uh, is the adap adaptability of uh, citizen science in Asian countries. Uh, so what is the, uh, you know, uh, barriers or how we can enab enable these things so that uh, it will be more effective. And uh, since we have an experience, uh, and uh, is a vast experience, probably can also give us, uh, you know, wisdom of thoughts and how we, we uh, that success story in some of the his projects can be uh, beneficial in adapting that in Asian countries. So uh, maybe uh, I'll uh, just to request uh, Henda to, do you have anything, any thought uh, to, uh, you know, uh, just to open up this question from the others as uh, one of the, you know, uh, participants also indicated because there are some of them are uh, reactive and some of them are neutral. So how do we, <laughs> and mostly you will see that uh, the neutral uh, people will be more, uh, the reactive will be out of 100, there will be one and uh, 99 will be neutral. So how do we uh, influence them? Uh, I think we already touched on this question, but the, and, and I agree, 99% will be neutral and the 1% will, will be who you want to engage with. Um, you know, we talked about finding the thing that motivates them, what's, inf what's uh, important to them in terms of their day-to-day -day lives and behavior and moving away from air pollution and talking about things like health and health effects, I think is really valuable there. Um, but also I think it, it it goes back to, I think it was a question or it was a statement by uh, Sudhir, was it? Who said, uh, the voice of the individual can make a minor difference, but he believes that uh, my voice does make a major difference, starting with educating my families and friends. And I think that's another way of engaging with the neutral person is that it goes back you know, to the point about you, you don't need to engage 100 people. You need to influence 10 who can then influence another 10 who can then influence another 10. Um, and that can be a way to kind of break down these barriers and get people who traditionally may not engage with these type of projects, uh, get them on board. Uh, uh, and I'm just uh, trying to look at it. Uh, the first uh, uh, you know, uh, question we would like to revolve the adaptability of uh, citizen science in Asian countries. In many Asian countries, uh, one of the challenges is the education. Uh, so maybe in the, many of the Western countries, uh, the education may be something uh, they were aware of it and it's easy to communicate. But here, uh, the major challenge will be how, what is the mode of communication? For example, you mentioned about some workshop, uh, local community engagement. Uh, so here, uh, there could be an uh, you know uh, uh, you know barrier could be uh, you know poverty uh, the, uh, so the, how do we uh, look at uh, this and what you uh, feel that uh, the, the, you know uh, from your experience uh, particularly for the asian countries uh, this this is the way we should start uh, so that uh, there there could be a, some way we can adapt the citizen science in in air quality management um I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that question. I think that that question might be best posed to someone who comes from a, an, an Asian country rather than a, uh, someone from the West of Europe. Um, but certainly with, with citizen science and with engagement, public engagement around challenges like air pollution, indeed around any environmental challenge, reaching those hard to reach communities, not just neutral people, but people who come from perhaps a, a, a low education background or people who come from um a socially deprived background who let's be honest are more uh 
more concerned on a day-to-day -day basis about put, putting food on the table than they are about um, environmental issues. Engaging with them and getting them involved in these projects is exceptionally difficult. It really, really is difficult. And I very, I'll be very honest, it's not something that we have solved in Europe, never mind uh, anywhere else. Um, you saw from the WECAM project, we had an ambition to reach 20% from a socially deprived background. So one out of five people we would hope came from a socially deprived background and we didn't reach that target. It was just too difficult, too challenging to reach. Um, education is really, really important. But I believe personally that it doesn't necessarily have to be the traditional forms of education in terms of going to school, uh, learning through the kind of education system. But actually, you can have education in the form of CPDs in the form of continuous professional development, in the form of workshops, in the form of informal gatherings where you, you come along and you learn from people. Um, what we have found is expecting people from um, poorer communities or from uneducated communities to come to you will not happen. You need to go to them. And you need to go to them again. I'm going to use the point about local champions. You need to go to them through the pathway of a local champion, someone who's trusted, someone who they they respect, someone who they have a belief in and they know is is engaging with you for the right reasons. And if you can create that trust, and I think it came up in some of the questions, if you can create that trust and if you can create that environment of um of a kind of a, a safe space or a shared space, then I think you can actually start to have a really, really useful and meaningful conversations and make it easier to get people on board. But we, we need to break away from this kind of traditional mindset of how education happens um, and realize that many people will enjoy education in different ways. I'll use myself as, a, as, as, as an example. I hated school. I absolutely hated school. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy this idea of learning by memorizing things, if you know what I mean. I didn't enjoy this kind of process of preparing for exams. And when I went off and I did my, my undergraduate and when I did my, my, I started to get it, I started to enjoy it a little bit more. But it was only when I went to my master's and my PhD, particularly where I was becoming an independent researcher and I was learning for my own motivation that I really started to enjoy learning. Now, I'm somebody who's gone from school through an undergraduate into a master's, into a PhD, into a research field, and I'm now a university professor. But I hated school. I hated that form of learning. So I think we need to think differently about moving beyond traditional models. And again, listening to people and how they want to learn and adapting to their needs rather than just trying to project our own uh, constructs on top of them. Yeah, thank you, uh, Hinda, for uh, you know nice uh, uh, summary of you know putting the various informations, uh, particularly in uh, taking uh, the citizen science. Uh, I would have one uh, thought uh, on uh, maybe the Ben can answer this. Uh, how to like you know? Yes, you Ben has indicated there are several challenges with the data uh, we were getting. The one of the thing is the accuracy of the data which we are obtaining. So then, in such case, how do we make the citizen science data uh, you know relevant to the policy aspect? Because this is a one question. Because all the sophisticated instrumentation being used in the policy, but uh, now. Uh, this is a data reliability is a question. How do we, what do you have any comments, uh, uh, William? Yeah, so th I can add one thing on uh, WeCount and Home, and I think Endem might have a perspective on WeCount as well, but it is really challenging. So policy makers may turn around, if we think about low cost sensors and say, this is low cost data. This isn't, this isn't what I need. This isn't what uh, I, I can use in any particular policy landscape. But if you are collecting data in an area that hasn't got any data at all before now, then that data can become incredibly valuable. So you can use it within that landscape. You can use low cost data in areas that haven't generated data before and say, this is what we found using these devices. That can be an incentive to then potentially introduce the reference analyzers, for example, into those types of 
spaces. So you can use it as um, an indicative tool, as a screening tool, um, but a more advanced screening tool than we traditionally um, use. If I think of the um, homes under the microscope project, so that's about airborne microplastics. So no one has looked for airborne microplastics in any level of depth indoors, at least um, before. There's a, a couple of papers emerging recently. So in terms of policy making, that is straight away a new sphere of, of data. They don't have data. There are no more sophisticated techniques to generate that type of data. Low cost data is the pinnacle of, <laughs> of the measurement that we can do there. So from a policy perspective, that's as good as it gets. So that can essentially put it um, maybe on a, a policy par with traditional pollutants and their reference analyzers. And, and uh, I know you have a perspective on we count from how you've encountered policy makers reactions to data um when the data tells them what they like they love it when the data tells them what they don't like you <laughs> tend to get oh it's low cost it, it you know it, it has problems it has issues um and i have to be honest as a scientist i sometimes react in the very same way so that's understandable i think from a policy perspective the policy makers need trust uh, as in they need to trust the evidence that's been given to them now when you have if we think of ben's tree of uh, of analyzers when you have your your reference method the the level or the margin of error is quite small when you have your your kind of screening tools like the air mesh um, or the zephyr the margin is slightly larger, but it can be acceptable. When it becomes the low cost sensor, the margin is quite substantial. And we've seen this by the other excellent presentation we saw on the, um, the hybrid network. So ensuring that there is enough trust in the data is really important for policymakers so that they can make informed decisions. Now, I personally, thinking about WeCount, I would personally not make a policy decision on the basis of the we count traffic sensor because the margin of error is too big but what i would do is i would use that data as ben mentioned as a screening data set as a tool to allow me to create a, a more dense spatial network of sensors as a tool to help me uh, generate the first data set to try and identify problems and issues and i would use that data to inform where I would then put more expensive resources into play and into action. And then it is those more expensive monitoring kits and more expensive resources, which I would then make a policy decision on the back of. So it's, it's an interim step, if you like, between no data and uh, um, reliable data, if you like, and a really, really valuable screening tool to try and, to try and close that, that gap. The final thing I'd say about this data, and it comes to a question that, that was asked from uh, Krishna Prasad and the presentation we've just heard about the integrated network, is the value of validation in terms of putting these different types of techniques together, co-locating them and looking at the performance of those, and then using things like machine learning and AI to then kind of calibrate and validate your sensors as you, as you have them spread about your network. I think that's where we're going here in that we, we will then be able to use low cost techniques, collocate them with reference methods, and then use kind of clever uh, systems uh, through things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to do real time calibration of what's going on. And I saw a really, really important point in that presentation about the integrated network is that a sensor developed in Barcelona may not be applicable in India. A sensor developed in India may not be applicable in China and vice versa. Um, and it goes back to the point about local context and, and, and the value, ensuring that uh, the tech you use is fit for purpose in the environment you're working in. Um, but yes, we, we do get some, uh, some interesting responses from policymakers. But I go all the way back to the beginning about this quadruple helix, you know, about citizens, policymakers, industry, and scientists all coming together from the very beginning. You do that, and then you have this collaborative uh, step where you, you collectively build faith, and you collectively build trust, and you collectively uh, build um, an understanding of what the data can tell you and can tell you, as opposed to the citizen scientists in one corner and the policymakers in the other corner talking at each other rather than with each other.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, interesting perspective, uh, and particularly uh, in the data uh, science in terms of management. Uh, the last uh, part, which you nicely mentioned, uh, the, how do you ensure the legacy of uh, citizen science? Uh, basically, I just look at it because uh, we you see uh, in uh, in the Indian context we have a, a you know a standards for a residential area standards for ecologically sensitive areas standards for industrial area then we have a standards for traffic site now the economics plays an important role for example residential area uh, some community may be interested to protect but whereas in an, an uh, a central business district the business driv uh, drives there. And industrial again, the industries drives there. So how do we, you uh, know, bring out this legacy of citizen science uh, in addressing these issues? Is that a question for me or Ben? I think you both of you can just uh, <laughs> share your thought process. Um, so legacy, um, as with all research projects, and I think we've all experienced this. The project runs for three years. You get to the end of the three years, you get to month 36 and everything just stops because the money runs out and we have to uh, we have to reload and start on the next project and go again and find other funding streams and things like that. And that to some extent is 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 kind of no difference with a citizen science project in that, in that a lot of the background mechanisms will stop. But one of the things we always try and do is to um, build capacity, is to teach, educate, train as we work our way through. Now, that can be in uh, the kind of um, scene setting and community building. That can be in the tech and how it works. That can be in the data and the data analysis, as you've seen. All the way through those phases, we're constantly trying to educate. We're constantly trying to share ideas. And we're constantly trying to uh, to build capacity. Now, the idea being that when the project ends in terms of project time and funding, that you have built a self-sustaining community that can continue beyond the lifetime of your funding and the and the amount of effort you have or the amount of resources that you have. Now, little things have to happen for that to happen. You, you need you know reliable tech. You need easy tech to fit. You know, if I can't hit, if I can't fix it with a small hammer, can I fix it with a big hammer? You know, it has to be as simple as that. Um, but by by building this capacity as you go, the idea is that you now have a community of citizen scientists who now all know each other, who all work with each other. One of them might be really good with the tech and can solve problems for their neighbors. One might be really good at the data analysis and can analyze their neighbor's data. One might be really good at advocacy and communication and social media, and you find your little champions, your little um, uh, your little uh, uh, scientists who are going to continue this process um, for you. So really, in terms of legacy beyond the lifetime of the project, it is true training and it is true capacity development and it is through education. Also, then, in terms of the tech itself, my personal attitude is it's yours to keep. Um, I don't want it back. Quite often the tech, if you start a project on day one, after three years, the tech is quite often out of date anyway. So if you were about to start again, you would probably upgrade to a new sensor or, or whatever it might be. So I always try and make sure that the, the, the technology stays with the citizen and that we don't then try and claw everything back and you know completely shut them off, that they continue to work what they do or work as they do. And then the final thing I would say is about this idea of training the trainer. And again, going back to this point that you need to train 10 people and then let them train another 10 people and another 10 people and another 10 people. And it kind of snowballs then. It starts to build momentum and it starts to take from there. Um, in terms of the legacy from, from the other end of the lens, which is the policy lens, um, what we have seen in, in a couple of projects, particularly in WECOM projects, not in the UK, but where we've had spin-offs in, in the Netherlands, is that we have seen local authorities who have seen the value in what WECOM created, and they have taken ownership of it, and they have provided more funding for more sensors and to grow the network and to build it from there, because they understand 
the, the, the value in the data that they're getting out of it, but they also understand the value it creates in terms of the new conversation that happens between the, the local authority and, and the citizens. So the, the kind of the, by making noise about it, by showing the successes, by showing the outcomes, by showing the impact, when you stop, that's only when the regulators and the local authorities and the businesses realize just exactly what they had in front of them. And often then they, they like to jump in and try and maintain momentum and keep it going. Um, but the main thing is to try and try and educate, try and build capacity, try and allow people to, you've built those relationships, you've built those networks, you've built that capacity so that when you step away, it doesn't stop. It still continues to maintain momentum. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Inda. Uh, uh, William, uh, uh, will it possible for you to share some, uh, you know, uh, your experience uh, that can be beneficial? For example, there are so many young researchers who would like to do a similar, uh, you know, exercise to go to community and try to, you know, uh, teach some uh, science uh, and involve them. So, what is the kind of an a barrier or enabler? which you see, uh, which you experienced uh, that may be beneficial for this young researchers? Oof, I, th I think the, f the first barrier is access to funding, to be honest. <laughs> now, though, though funding is already there. You assume that funding is there. Now okay. uh, it, it is uh, how to implement it. Okay. So th I think the barriers are essentially how do you reach the communities that you want to reach? So in, in Bristol, we have a really diverse community. Um, both in terms of um, ethnic diversity and in terms of um, diversity of income and um, education. And in citizen science, you want to be able to reach all communities because you want to be able to basically do the best science with the best representation um, of your of your community. The challenges are often uh, how do we actually reach these communities? Do we have to, to go to specific areas of a town? Do we as Enda says, do we sit in one area and hope people come to us? That often really doesn't work. Or can we use other partners to help us reach these different types of communities? So, for example, what we've done is we've reached in to um, an organization called the Bristol Green Capital Partnership, which has relationships with community groups right across the city. So that was our gateway in to being able to work with um, a diverse group of people and a diverse range of businesses. Um, if you want to then bring others say industry into those types of conversations with citizens, then you need partners who can who can reach those um, industries and bring them along with us. So I think partnership building is probably one of the most powerful tools. You can have networking conversations and partnership building um, from a citizen science perspective opens so many doors to do so many really interesting things. If you can build relationships, build partnerships, then things will happen. Positive things will happen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, please, Brenda. Uh, I was going to add a point there, and uh, it's more of a personal thing, in that I had to, I had to learn how to not be a scientist, and that might sound like a really weird thing to say, but as a scientist, as somebody who is kind of data obsessed and and, and numbers orientated, if you like, we often get obsessed with the R squared value. You know, we often get obsessed with with getting the data to the next decimal point, you know, to just a little bit more in terms of accuracy. And I think with this, we I, I had to, which is a very uncomfortable process, but I had to l learn how to not obsessed about an R square value. I had to learn how to to understand that a range of getting a value of of, you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 is perfectly fine is absolutely acceptable. Didn't have to worry if it was 42.2 or 48.1 or whatever it might be, that that range is more than enough to have the conversation that you want to have. And I know for a lot of our colleagues who have worked in these or worked in these types of projects, that that kind of stepping back from, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the aim we all have in terms of accuracy and you know, getting our our signed our our um our significance value to kind of p equals zero point zero 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 one or whatever it might be, we had to try and unlearn that because again we have to remember that we're working with citizens, so we have to start from their benchmark rather than our benchmark, 
Um, so I think on a personal basis, that was something that I, I, I struggled a little bit with, but I'm now a lot more comfortable with. Um, and, and the other thing I would say in terms of a huge value that we've had, Ben and I are, as you've seen from our kind of profiles, we're both air pollution scientists. You know, we're, we're monitoring people, we're data people, we're modelers, we're, we're policy people. Um, and it, but in a very early stage, we brought science communication professionals alongside us. So people who have expertise in communicating science and engaging with the public. And they were hugely valuable, hugely, hugely valuable in terms of different techniques, different methodologies, and in terms of us you know, stepping back from being you know, the professor to just being someone who can who can talk to people about data and numbers. Um, so again, the interdisciplinarity is, is going to be hugely, hugely important. Don't think just because you know how to use monitoring equipment, don't think you can run a citizen science project. You need to bring these different expertise in, in beside you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we are running out of time, but uh, uh, maybe the, my last question, uh, maybe uh, to get your uh, you know wisdom of thoughts to understand. Uh, in the community, we also have uh, young childrens, maybe the uh, educated and the the older, or an you know the, the senior citizens. We can say. So who do we you know? communicate or who do we uh, easy to uh, look at this uh, you know science aspect uh, will be easy to uh, meet and uh, uh, just uh, bring it uh, or uh, interacting with them and probably will be more beneficial in understanding and uh, uh, you know provide more uh, you know values to the system so the the i would i would say I would say you would try and leave no one behind. You know, I would say this. So you try and engage with, with everyone that you want to, but the engagement techniques you would implement for school children would be very different from the engagement techniques you would implement implement for the, the guy who was driving the Lamborghini in Ben's presentation would be very different from how you would engage with policymakers, how you'd engage with businesses, how you would engage with, with the elderly, whatever it might be. Um, again, the value of the science communication people coming in beside you is, is hugely, hugely important there. What we have done in, in a lot of our projects is create a lot of um, um, activity packs for different age groups of children. Remember what I said, citizen science is hugely valuable in terms of STEM skills. So science, technology, engineering and maths. It goes beyond that. Given that you're looking at spatial data, you can also look at geography and, and English and other subjects like that, and even art and creative subjects. So what we have done in, in WeCount is we've actually created uh, packages, packets, uh, packages of school engagement activities that different school kids of different ages can, cry, can try and get involved in. This can be writing essays, it can be doing artwork, it can be kind of school role play, whatever it might be. Um, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the sensor. Um, you know, it can be about uh, um, the other skill sets that you start to develop. And personally, again, my own personal observation, the, the school's work is often the most fun um, because children are just so creative. They're just sponges. They just take it all in, um, embrace it all, engage with it. They want to learn. They want to understand. And you get some really, really fabulous different exciting um insights and ideas and a lot of really really fun stuff as well um so you know one of the things we've tried to create from the end of these of our during these projects is these kind of uh, supportive packs in terms of education packs and av advocacy packs that can be used for different publics and for different uh different audiences and different stakeholders yeah thank you very much uh, in the interest of time uh, if there are any questions, uh, maybe you can just uh, send it to us through email, then uh, probably we will communicate to Enda and uh, get uh, and uh, then and we'll get their views for your question. So on behalf of uh, SIFA Network, uh, we thank uh, Pro Professor Enda Hayes and uh, Dr. Ben Williams from uh, University of West of England. Uh, it is one of the leading university in uh, air quality management and uh, I am fortunate to interacting with uh, this university for several years. And uh, Professor Langrest is a kind of a leading uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, expert uh, in the UK. 
uh, and he has contributed several aspects in air quality management and joe is uh, currently is collaborating with the cat time project and we are very fortunate uh, to you know have a, such a collaboration in the long uh, uh, term and uh, continue to look forward and particularly this uh, the new idea that uh, citizen science yeah. is something which you already having a lot of experience so on behalf of a uh, sipa network uh, and uh, uh, department of civil engineering iit madras we thank you uh, yeah. mr enda and uh, dr ben williams for sparing your valuable thoughts and uh, interesting talk uh, workshop in providing lot of information i am sure that uh, many students uh, and researcher and particularly from the industry participants they will all going to be get benefited with your talk and uh, by, you know participating in this particular workshop so i also uh, would like to thank all the participants uh, particularly some the different sector we classify them to get some views and then i realize it after listening to the uh, ban uh, this thing so we have a neutralizers and also some active so it doesn't matter whether we pick up a industry or a, uh, you know uh, 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 regulators or the citizens or from the research side it only matters who will be the reactive so i i completely agreeing with that now uh, with uh, dr ben but I'll, i thank all of them uh, for their interesting uh, uh, views and uh, the, the slides and uh, uh, you know your uh, 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 videos we will also going to share with all the part, uh, participating uh, uh, part, uh, participants so i think yeah with this uh, we would like to thank you uh, professor and i think uh, you have spared a very valuable time uh, I, I thank you very much Thank you very much. My pleasure. Always happy to uh, to to work alongside you, Shiva, and 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 share our ideas. Maybe the next time you can present to us, and we can learn from a from an Asian sure. context. Sure, uh, Professor Enda. I'm just thinking. Maybe I would thought. Uh, maybe we'll include uh, you and uh, Ben. Maybe we can. We have currently doing a, a, a project for three cities: one for mm -hmm. uh, Chennai, another for Madurai, another for uh, Tirchi. so these are all uh, different uh, sizes of population and probably mm -hmm. we thought we will ex experiment this uh, citizen science package uh, uh, in uh, uh, you know uh, that's why i was just thinking maybe we will uh, try to have an another you know uh, meeting with you and uh, maybe with uh, some uh, you know local community uh, uh, experts and then see that how we can design a small project and then uh, uh, yeah. the funding is already there so uh, that's why i told ben ben need no need to worry about the funding here now uh, <laughs> the only thing is how do we <laughs> you know uh, implement this uh, science aspect in communicating to the citizens no problem happy to help just come and talk to us whenever you're ready yeah thank you uh, professor enda and uh, dr ben and i also would like to thank uh, uh, professor kare and uh, uh, mr sachin uh, for bringing out this uh, hybrid uh, uh, air quality monitoring network and a very interesting presentation sachin is working some last uh, one year on this particular uh, uh, topic and several years of experience in uh, sensor air uh, project uh, thank you very much uh, professor kare and uh, dr sachin mr sachin uh, thank you sir so i uh, also thank uh, dr madhusudan and uh, dr suva uh, dr suvarna for organizing this uh, for on behalf of uh, sipa and uh, mr swarup Uh, for all the coordination so thank you very much uh, so uh, have a safe stay uh, see you all uh, in the next year maybe probably hope we will have uh, some uh, in person meetings uh, maybe after the <laughs> after the uh, new year thank you everyone thanks everyone bye now bye 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 ben bye and uh,